This is for the nerds, this is for the brainiacs, this is what we deserve. Go ahead and play it back, you ain't gonna touch me, you not gonna do nothing, you are not above me, I bet you wish you was me, I know it, I know. What's up everybody, welcome to an action-packed Monday edition of the Only Friends Podcast. We're here as always, ready to bring to you the wrap up from the weekend, and we got a lot to cover. But before we get to that, I want to give a huge shout out to our sponsor for the week, BetMGM Poker. Big props to them. Do you have what it takes to become a BetMGM Poker champion? Starting September 15th, players in New Jersey, Michigan, and Pennsylvania will battle for state by state supremacy in the BetMGM Poker Online Championships. Over 2 million is guaranteed throughout the series. Visit betmgm.com for the full series schedule and take your seat today. They, uh, they have a big series going on over there. Obviously, I uh, wish I could have gotten home. I was actually supposed to go home this week to watch the, the Steelers battle the Browns, but uh, I'm unfortunately not going to be able to make it. But be sure to check that out. There's over 2 million guaranteed over all the sites. Uh, daily 100k guarantee phase ones in all states that starts at 8 p.m. every day. Uh, jealous of you guys, but I'll just be here, you know, playing WSOP uh, bracelet events, whatever. It is what it is. Welcome back. Thank you. Appreciate how, it, buddy. How does it feel to be back? The same. Mm. <laughs> it feels the same. Uh, after this weekend, honestly, I'm a little bit more salty that mm. that I'm not going to be able to go home and and watch that. Yeah, because terrible Browns team didn't attempt. go too well. I mean, the Steelers didn't look too much better. You shut your fucking mouth. They lost mouth. to a fucking shitty ass Patriots. They team. They did lose to a shitty ass Patriots team. I I do concur with that. Uh, much as I lost to a bunch of uh, shitty ass players on the bike. <laughs> wow, that's <laughs> fine. Based. I could say that because we're all friends. Mm-hmm. We're friends here. Not anymore. No, not not all of yeah. us. Everyone I played yeah, with on the I bike. Know. Not anymore. They're not your friends. Yeah, that's fair. <laughs> Uh, honestly, that was one of the more enjoyable lineups I've played in a while. I can't remember, and maybe because like the stakes are a little bit lower, uh, <clears throat> you, you're not fighting quite as hard. But I I can't remember losing that many buy-ins and being that talkative at the same time. Very reminiscent of the old days in mm. uh, in Ivy's room. As in, you just kind of lost a little bit, and we're still kind of amicable and not as angry or jaded as you may have been in a different spot? Uh, no, no, not that. Just, I, I'm, I'm happy to be a good loser. Mm-hmm. I, I don't mind that. I'm used to playing that role. Yeah, yeah. It's more so that uh, in poker, generally, uh, there are few winners and many losers, right? Yes. So when, when we're usually playing the normal 100, 200 type games, whatever, the conversation is jovial and it's, it's shallow. And it's usually just filling the void in between hands, right? Right. Uh, you're not really getting, getting down to the nitty gritty and you're not learning all that much about one another. But more importantly, you're not really having fun at each other's expense all that much. Mm. Uh, and maybe it's just because Lynn was in the game. Uh, she really brings it out of me. Mm. But there was a lot of needles being thrown. Yeah. The accountant's really good natured too. Uh, you know, he wins and loses, uh, I wouldn't say with grace, but he, <laughs> he wins and loses in a fun way. Like, he can take the needles, he can throw the needles. It's, it's, it's a lot of fun. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, yeah, there was, like, just a ton of jabs exchanged um, in between hands, during hands, as hands were playing out. Uh, and, and you're happier about that. A lot of speech play. I enjoy speech play. Yeah, I, so I would like to be it. in more environments where uh, it's encouraged. Those are mm-hmm. the best environments. Yeah. And when, when you have a whole table having fun, talking, just, yeah. Yeah, I, I, I've, great. I've become far too accustomed to just being on the river and either Garrett or myself just having a conversation with ourself where the person we're playing against is just never answering and <laughs> the other six robots at the table also aren't going to partake. Um, so yeah, I mean, like, it's, it's moved a far... It's, it's moved a long way away from that. Like, even going back to, like, 2017, I can think of a lot of river spots where... 2017, Wow. Yeah, it seems like forever ago, that's right? Six, five years ago, yeah. Five. It's so far to, to me. That's current day. Lynn is like, I'm I wasn't concerned. even born yet. I was. I, <laughs> I graduated high school in 2017. Wow. Yeah. I graduated. Uh, that was a while ago for you, for sure. For me, that was the 
that was when poker like turned the page on on street poker so to speak as in when the pile solver started attacking yeah from the public community yeah well where i think it became en vogue Mm -hmm. right like up until that point it was pretty heavily celebrated to just be your own guy right being a street like player was a thing and once the solver era appeared that became frowned upon yeah it was very more it was a very judgy era right uh i think we're i think we're finally shifting out of it mainly (laughs) because a lot of the people who got um coherent when it comes to theory yeah realize like okay well now that i understand all this stuff i don't need to use all this stuff right right so now i'm just like you have your things you thought you knew you learn things you realize you didn't know some of those things and then you refine yeah so now you're on the other side of the step one of knowledge when it comes to poker yeah at least from a theoretical baseline yes exactly basically you get to the point where you understand what's supposed to happen in theory then you just look around and see that's not happening exactly and then you say okay well that's not happening but with this theoretical knowledge now how can i absolutely just pummel these people that are disobeying right it's like here's the error what do i do about it now that i know that this is what's supposed to happen in theory yeah, I think, I think that's... Uh, I don't want to get too deep into this conversation because we have a full show today. I but know, I'm the worst with this. No, 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 it's fine because I do think <laughs> this is something to bring up. I think one major point that people don't understand about uh, studying game theory as it applies to poker is this notion that uh, game go. theory or GTO more specifically equals equilibrium. Right. Right, because the, the notion is that equilibrium means by definition... That you've reached a point in uh, in the application of strategy where neither person is incentivized to move, mm-hmm. right? Any sort of movement off of equilibrium will cause an, an EV loss, Correct. right? In reality, uh, even in our versions of uh, study and ab- abstractions, that's just not true. Right. We can always add, subtract variables. We can expand. We can do all of these things that will constantly shift equilibria. Right. A good example of this real quick would be choosing a different bet size at a spot versus pot versus 75%. Correct. Right. If someone only studies 75%, when they see pot, they start, might start making mistakes and not know what the counter is. Yeah, I think, I think even more specific to that is uh, people who study one sizing strategies versus multiple sizings. Mm-hmm. Uh, what ultimately ends up occurring is the response to a single sized equilibrium yeah. where you're restricted to one bet size is going to look very different than the response to uh, a multiple bet size restriction and that's the way we have to start framing it if we want to be honest with each other in the conversation is that the solver is a restricted mechanism yeah. right so we're restricting the variables that we input mm-hmm. and that in turn is restricting the output yeah so the idea that we can't move and gain ev is just incorrect Right. Right. It's just not going to be something that you can practically find. Right. So the whole reason I was saying all that is because a lot of people who are just now getting uh, into the weeds of theoretical study will say like, you know, uh, people will say like, well, that's not the max exploit. That's not the way you earn the most amount of money. Mm-hmm. Or, or like they'll say something to the effect of like, well, how do you capitalize on mistakes? And they just say, I remain unwavering. I don't change. I'm indifferent as fuck. <laughs> right. So that's like, Dan O'Brien. it's like, well, you're wrong. You're just wrong. Like you will naturally be exploited by the environment in some scenarios that you haven't properly calibrated for. Yep. And you will be missing a bunch of exploits in other scenarios that you also haven't properly calibrated. <laughs> You're for. actually incentivized to be different. Correct. Right. Instead and that'll of- always be the case as long as humans are playing the game. Right. Which makes poker beatable. Right. And that's our GTO talk for the day. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the happy which- you're back, man. Yeah. I well, miss this. While we're... <laughs> While we're discussing that, I guess, uh, friendly reminder, every Monday, we have a new episode of Poker Out Loud out today. Today's episode two, you're going to see a hell of a hand being played by the man, the myth, the legend, Michael Acevedo uh, versus K-Rab. It's a doozy. Uh, check out our Twitter page if you want a preview of what that hand's going to look like. But be sure to check out uh, SolferY.io or, or sorry, solferwide.io, um, or hit, uh, I don't remember what the command is in the, in the chat. I think it's hashtag S for Y, maybe. I don't know. We should have these things listed Start clicking somewhere. buttons. You'll find it. We'll start. We should really have these things up there. There we go. We got, we got a little something, Whoa, something for you. Whoa, look at that. Just, just press one of those in the, in the 
<laughs> chat and you will be taken to where you need to go. Fucking um, Guapo. God played, damn, man. Did play one hand off stream that was uh, <laughs> Dude, <come on>. annoying. <laughs> That's one word for it. It was annoying. My whole session felt like this hand, like this hand encapsulated my whole session. You were always up, well, this hand the, is different, but it just seems like you no, were always not. up against, no, no. <laughs> Well, this one's a little different because you were ahead most of the hand. The, the other hands, you were just always up against it. Yeah. Right. The only thing really different about this hand is that uh, it was played in such a way where I guaranteed to win or lose the max, mm -hmm. where every other time I got cooled off, I guaranteed to win or lose the min. Yeah, that's it. Um, yeah, there were a few hands. Uh, I played a hand against Andy that I probably should have folded where he was doing this weird thing where he kept donk leading mm. into the razor, um, and he just never had it. So he would fold to raises, he would give up turns, et cetera, et cetera. And then like the sixth time that he did it was a spot where I opened low jack and he defended big and then just led on four, three, three. And I had sevens. And instantly I was just like, he has it this time. Like he just has it this time. This is his sixth attempt at a donk lead. And he's gotten wrecked on all five before. Like for sure, he just has a three here. But I just paid. He just bet, bet, bet. And I just paid, paid, paid. Uh, which was no fun. I think it's okay. You know, you had a good hand to call. Yeah, I should trust my gut there. Um, <sighs> but, but the hand that happened off stream was uh, we were playing 2551. I opened 300 uh, low jack with ace queen of spades. Lynn three bets the button, and we are we were 180 blinds effective, so 18k effective. Mm -hmm. um, she three bets comes back to me, obviously, pure call. Flop is ace, ace, deuce, rainbow, no spade. Yep, and we lose the max somehow. I check. <clears throat> she bets third pot, which is good. Uh, I find the low frequency check raise. Probably not that low. Uh, yeah, I couldn't, I couldn't find anything for this depth in an anti game, but mm -hmm. it seems like it's about a third of the time or so. Yeah. Um, it was weird. So I ran it a few different times. Uh, the first time I ran it for a single size and it preferred big at a very low frequency. A big raise size? Yeah, like 5x. Uh, yeah. And then I ran it again for multiple sizes and it split very low frequency for big and then majority was the size I chose, like 2.5x. Yeah. yeah. You're targeting their high cards and their pairs that are going to have tougher spots. Yeah, later. the construction didn't really change. The frequency at which you got to do it changed a lot. So, like, you since I don't have a lot of 5-4, I think the small size functions better. Mm -hmm. um, because then you can just pure raise 5-4. You're supposed to raise, like, pocket threes here, too, yeah. right? Yeah, threes, fours, fives. Yeah, it's a classic thing. If you want to watch my course, it's in there. That's right. <laughs> if you guys want to see how to bluff on these textures, head over to solveforwide.io. Check out Landon's course on 3-bet pot defense. Yeah. Uh, so I check raise here. She calls. Turn is the king of diamonds. <laughs> Appears not great for us, but actually is... It's Yahtzee. Well, it's kind of neutral. It's really good. Ace-King, less existent. Yeah, but now more kings. She has six boats. Aw. No, I know. I'm no, saying I it's know. neutral. Yeah, it's yeah. just neutral. She had six boats on the... Or she had six better hands on the flop. Now she has six on the turn. Does... When the king come, I'm just really Oh, bad. actually, that's not true. It's worse. I'm, I'm really bad with, with math. Um, so when the king comes, Ace-King is obviously less likely... Correct. Yeah. But she picks up more value combos as a whole that beats you because of the kings. Yeah. So okay. uh, on flop, she has four combos of ace king. Mm -hmm. Right. On turn, she has three combos of ace king and now three combos of kings. Oh, I see. So it's actually worse, but right. it's so, still so not. More, but. Yeah, but it's still not bad uh, specifically because it's a diamond. Mm -hmm. Um whatever i don't want to get into the nuance at all but the the ace of diamonds was not on the board uh -huh. uh so she has like backdoor floats in clubs and hearts mm -hmm. that are king high so that's kind of good we have a target right uh and then also just like the worst ace highs mm -hmm. so bet uh i think i bet 35 into 52 so like 66 yeah calls river offsuit seven we have about pot pot and a quarter maybe all in. Grip and rip. Get the look back. Just to make sure. Mm. Just to make sure. And I go, fuck. The look back snap is the worst feeling. Well, it was weird when she looked back because I was, I was like, wow, she has kings. But why would she ever have to look back at kings? So 
part of me was kind of like hopeful. Like she's just checking to make sure it's actually Ace Jack. Right. Ace Jack, Ace 10. And then she goes, call. And Fuck. I'm like, Ace Queen. Yeah. She has Ace 7 of diamonds. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's a relatively standard hand from both sides. Just yeah. one of those spots where. Uh, Real annoying. It does not go to you. No. <laughs> No, so it was the difference between winning 15K or losing 35. I chose to be down the max. You didn't <laughs> choose that. It chose me. Yeah, the, the universe chose that. It chose me. Mm. Yeah. Did the fun. universe choose anything? Well, depends on how you feel about the universe variants, as a whole. Yeah. Uh, larger powers that Just be. Just wasn't your time. Sure. Just wasn't your time. Determinism versus control and free will. I don't know. Was it your fate to see the seven on the Who river? knows? <laughs> Who knows? I'm happy for Lynn. She finally got even. Um, <laughs> a small price to pay. A, sm a very small price to pay. I hope everybody in the audience is uh, pleased with all of this poker talk that we led with because it was, it, was sheer, it was a sheer ploy to keep you here while we get into the NFL. Mm -hmm. Now... <laughs> now you're in. Now, let's get now we get into the real Monday conversation. What a fucking weekend wow. of the NFL. And that's hard for me to say with a smile on my face coming when off a Steelers, Steelers loss. loss. Yeah. Man. Yeah. Every single Monday podcast after a Sunday is just going to be, wow, what an NFL week. Man, no. uh, honestly. Sometimes, yeah, sometimes they're you, have, you have dead weeks. They're yeah. definitely dead weeks. This one week. was not one. Look, I got to the office with just enough time to watch, like, uh, it was over while I was in the car, basically. The, I, I'm sitting here and I'm bemoaning. I'm like, why do I have to watch the Patriots kneel down? Like, why am I so sick in the head that I can't put on red zone that I need to watch with a minute 40 left? This asshole take a fucking knee. Take a fumble. Fumble a snap. Center it over his head. <laughs> uh, so I watch the kneel down and Conrad tells me, uh, I, go, I go, maybe on some planet uh, the, the Dolphins can complete this comeback versus the Ravens. And I didn't know what the score of the Jets game was, <laughs> but I knew that they had like, or sorry, I said it the opposite. I, I thought the Dolphins game was over. Yeah, because the it last was time, over. Yeah, I had looked and it was like thirty-five seventeen. Yeah, with like eight minutes left. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, okay, that game's over. Fuck me. I go, maybe the Jets can pull it out against the Browns. And Conrad goes, oh, the Jets already lost. And I'm like, <laughs> fuck. That was the only game that. I, so like now, I think I think the whole North won except for us. With and the then bangles, he, with the and then, and then a minute later, Conrad goes, the Jets scored. I go, scored? You said they lost. <laughs> well, they were down by fucking 15 or <laughs> something. <laughs> yeah, we were yeah. getting in the car to go to the office, and Matt just looks at me because I'm from, my, from Boca, a Dolphins fan, and goes, your Dolphins fucking stink. They're dead today. <laughs> I was like, okay, sure. And then we get to the office. and So now... I have life now that I realize, you know, he just flat out lied to me. He, he hood lawyered me. Uh, and I turn on red zone, right? So I see, like, the Jets are making this fucking epic comeback. And uh, they're, like, lining up for the onside. I'm like, okay, legit. They, and Conrad's like, it's over. They have no timeouts. There's a minute 30 on the clock. I'm like, if they get the fucking onside, they're doing just fine. Great man. There it is, baby. Only the Browns. They find a way, don't they? Never rooted for Flacco so fucking hard. Yeah. That was quite the step. Far side, it's Conklin trying to get out of bounds, and he does. Flacco to Carter. Black on second down over the middle. Wilson dances his way down close to the fifth. I thought he got hurt there. Two chances. Black over the middle. It's got him. Touchdown. Garrett Wilson. Winner, 15 winner. yard strike. Well, I'm literally America going ape shit as they complete this comeback. Conrad's pissed. <laughs> He's Why? a Jets fan. You're pissed? <laughs> Jets and yeah, Giants. I want fan. a fucking draft pick. Oh my God. I don't want them to beat the fucking Browns. The Browns fucking suck. We're not going to be doing anything really this year. We don't have Zach Wilson in week six. Like, I'm literally just an anti-Browns fan. He's sour as could be. I'm, I'm just screaming and hooping and hollering. It's like, wow, this is sick. Like, what a fucking comeback. <laughs> and then, on top of that, Tua is just going off yeah. in the Miami game. That was awesome. Tua, that was crazy. The Tua to Tyreek uh, situation was strong. 
Yeah. He just what a day. Look at this stat line. This is just the fourth quarter. Fourth quarter. <laughs> just the fourth quarter alone, he already has better stats than Mitch Trubisky all season. <laughs> he threw for like He's already thrown more touchdowns. More touchdown passes. <laughs> Maybe more passing yards. It's close. <laughs> he threw close. for 469, six touchdowns, and two interceptions just today. Is he available on the wire? Just the Pick fourth quarter alone, 200 yards, four touchdowns. What? What? I mean, so his crazy. receivers. Tyreek Hill had 11 receptions for 190 yards and two touchdowns, and Jalen Waddle had 11 receptions for like 170 yards and yeah. two touchdowns as well. Yeah, yeah. Two I have uh, Tyreek Hill in our league, by the way, Burke. Congrats on that. 43 points. Pretty nice. I was, I was <laughs> lamenting that I had dropped Baltimore's defense uh, <laughs> this week. Uh, I was yelling at Landon in the car. I go, what the fuck, man? Your Dolphins are supposed to be good. I fucking dropped Baltimore's defense thinking that they were going to show up and, you know, and prove show me up right. Did. And I'm looking at, the mo- at that moment, Baltimore's D had like 12 points. I'm like, Jesus Christ. Yeah. And then by the time I get to the office, they have like three. <laughs> they still get three points now for the, their performance. There's been some yeah. reversals. Now the problem is I dropped them for Cleveland's D, uh, which also was doing just fine for a minute there. Yeah. They ended up with just three points, but I blew out this week anyway, so it's okay. Yeah. I uh, I had a good week with... We both got a victory then, huh? Yeah. Nice. All yeah, right, we're, we're back in it. We're back in it. But most importantly about back in it, the Steelers may have lost. But they're back in it. They're still in first place? <laughs> yes. The entire fucking North. You, you know who's in last? The Bungles. They are the Bungles. The, the Bungles. The, the Super Bowl losing Bungles yes. are in last place. And do you want to know Why? Because of another fucking... Actually, we didn't even finish on this Miami comeback. So this, this was insane. Uh, they, they closed the game to within uh, a score. And then the Ravens marched down again. Or sorry, they closed the game within, uh, to tie it. I mean, Lamar Jackson had an unbelievable Sick game. game. I, that, that, feel bad for him. I don't feel bad for him. I never feel but, bad for him. But I'm Give just him saying, the fuck you, out. Know, it, you know, it sucks to have his such a QB good game rating, and not win. His stat line was 21 for 29, 318 yards, mm-hmm. three touchdowns, and 142.6 QB rating. Yeah, that's a, that's a really good day for a quarterback and a running back. Yeah. <laughs> <Put them together. laughs> the, I didn't even fucking say how many yards he had on the right ground. Nine carries for 120. Right, 119. yeah. The yeah. 120 yards rushing, like the, they haven't had a running back in Baltimore for four seasons. Well, they got one now. Yeah, he's, no, he's uh, under it's center. It's always been him. It's yeah. insane. He might like throw for 4,000 and rush for 1,000 this year. It's wild. Uh, I feel like they had somebody rec- in the recent years. Well, they, they had J.K. Had, Dobbins, but he's yeah, been hurt. That's what it was, okay. Yeah, he's been hurt, and they just, they sat him again this week, even though he's practiced all week. So they're kind of just they had back Ingram in. for two seasons Ingram too. As well, yeah, mm-hmm. but Ingram- which. It, is crazy because he seems to do okay elsewhere. Like he went back to New Orleans. I mean, he's just spelling uh, what's his face, uh, Kamara. But still, uh, you know, he's he's a reasonable option when you have nobody else in the yeah. backfield. Well, I looked because I I saw I had um, Kenyon Drake. I picked him up in one of my leagues, and he did nothing. I was just like, I don't know what he had like four rushes for you know he less stinks. than ten yards or something like that. Yeah. And I go, oh man, they they must have actually given like Davis the ball. A lot this time. I looked. He had like less, less yeah, yeah, attempts yeah. and less yardage. No, taking a I running back like, in okay, Baltimore. So just taking a running back yeah. in Baltimore's offense is like taking a running back in San Fran's offense. It's like it's just going to be Debo, and it's just going to be fucking. Well, that's not true. I mean, uh, Wilson I mean, did Elijah okay. Mitchell was like really good until he got hurt, but sure, he had a really good year last year. But yeah, he yeah, did. He did. but I mean, you know, they yeah. uh, especially now that Trey Lance got hurt. I think that yeah. you'll see a lot more of the, the old school West Coast offense with Garoppolo. Ebo and Ayuk's uh, value just went up. For sure. Yeah, that's for sure. Yeah, uh, I was celebrating. Uh, not that I want to see people get hurt, injury, but, but I have both of them. Celebrating your opportunity. Yeah, I, I got Ayuk as a handcuff in case Debo got hurt. And then I look and he just like has a career game yesterday. Not a career game, but he had a good game yesterday. It's like, okay, well, now he's a viable option moving forward. Um, but yeah, then we move into the afternoon games, or maybe it wasn't even an afternoon game. Bengals, uh, Cowboys. I think it was. It was an afternoon. I think game. it was afternoon. Yeah. Uh, I, it, guys, if you want betting advice, comrade's your fucking guy. Okay. <laughs> if if there is if there is someone to go to to get the scoop. Uh, to to get the down low on what's going to happen, this man is your man. Is okay? that how he's going to pay off the tap? Uh, yeah, a hundred percent. He's got uh, Joe Burrow's over. Uh, Yo, this guy has not even won a fucking prop bet against me, but he sees like no, um, I have. Eight, no, no, no which, I have. which one? The Le'Veon Bell one. 
Okay, okay. You won one out of 90. He's won one, <laughs> one out of 90. One. He's won one out of 90, and he sees, like, the fucking rainbow at the end of the tunnel. He's like, oh, let me talk about this one forever. All right, uh, so the, the, the oh, Burrow one God. was bad. It no, was bad. It Let's no, just, it, you can just take an L on this one, it man. Yeah. It's okay. Just the take an Chargers L. The Chargers are just going to beat fine. them for the rest of the, just, the rest of life. They just, lost one. They listen, had to piss off Justin listen, Herbert. Man, it's okay. And now it's good. We're it's good. all right. Come Sometimes on. you just have to take an L. So to they catch everybody up. They'll never make to it. To catch everybody up, Conrad has Joe Burrows making the Super Bowl more often than uh, Patrick, Patrick Mahomes Patrick Mahomes in the next 10 years. Uh, I have Mahomes aside, and somehow I got this at even money. I mean, as long as Mahomes makes it once, you win. Yeah, no agreed. way. Agreed. Uh, no way. They're on top of that, uh, you know, Conrad Conrad hits us with the Jets have already lost. There's like eight minutes left in the fourth quarter. That obviously came to fruition pretty well. Uh, then um, as the Dallas Cincy game is starting, he goes, there's no fucking way Dallas can win this game. <laughs> well, I mean, it's, I mean, of course the, I have to double down the like analysts, that. The analysts were high on Dallas this week. What? Who? Yeah. What? After you see Micah really? Parsons for fucking yeah, Micah one down. Parsons is a fucking terror. He is, and the offensive line for Cincinnati is absolutely right, atrocious. Right, but they have also have Micah um, Parsons caused fucking havoc. <laughs> yeah, but they also have Cooper Rush as their quarterback. And yeah, but like play. a lot of the analysts are really high on him, which yeah. is very strange because he he came into the league undrafted. Yeah, he got it done. I, I mean, I, hey, he's a very I, Duck I Hodges uh, type of storyline where he came into the league undrafted, but he's kind of proven himself. But he looks like a formidable mm -hmm. backup. Uh, there are a lot of people in the system saying that, like, you know, him and Dak kind of run a similar offensive style. Yeah. And, you know, he can manage the game and get it done. They have weapons there. They have a strong line. They have one of the better backs who seems to go underutilized as far as that's concerned. But their defense is legit. Micah Parsons is a he's fucking an force, animal. man. He's, he's an a, animal. Yeah. And he's going to eat up a bad offensive line all day long. And he did. He was a game changer. From Penn State. Right. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of Penn State guys out there. A lot of pit guys out there too, um, but yeah. So that game then comes down to the wire, of course, of course, as it should. There it is. I thought he missed this for sure. So did I. I still think he missed it. I don't see how it went it through. It went through. If you really look, it went through. Cowboys. But it just it looked like it was sailing. So what I've come to conclude on the back end of yesterday is that one Steeler loss is equal to one Steeler win when the rest of the North also loses. Right. When, when the Browns, right. Bengals, and Ravens Are all lose. Are you just trying to find some way to be happy on Sunday? I was so happy. I felt the same. I mean, it was a wash, right? Yeah. I felt the same as I would feel after a Steeler win. If they had a won, that would have been much better. Oh, I would have felt been. like they just won the Super Bowl. <laughs> I would have felt like I felt last I week when they stole one from the Bungles. They did not deserve that win. They would No, they absolutely deserved that win. Yeah. They just tried to give it back to a team that didn't deserve the win. Right. Sorry, the defense deserved the win. Correct. Okay, well. That's right. Uh, let, let's not forget that that was a two-score game for pretty much the entirety of it until they fucked up the last six minutes. Mm -hmm. We can just forget about the entire game and just know that they won. Yes. And go with that. Yes, that's true. That's a W. It was sad to see them not be able to, to um, stop the Patriots and get the ball back at the end of the game. It's just like, was it just that ran sad? It. Or was it the well, fact the whole, that they, there's a lot of sadness? Their last game. two possessions took a total of one minute and 20 seconds yeah. and they ran six plays. Yeah. That, what, what are you doing? Did we ever find out how bad that punt was on fourth and. Yes, I, I looked it up. Uh, so shockingly, it was not as bad as I thought. The, uh, so it was fourth and two. Uh, the Patriots were on the Steelers' 42-yard line. Mm -hmm. So it's a 59-yard field goal attempt, uh, or they could go for it. There's two and a half minutes or three minutes left on the clock, I think. Uh, both teams have two timeouts. And I look at Landon and I go, the brutal thing about playing the Patriots here is that part... Uh, is that Belichick will never make a bad punt. And then he fucking punts. <laughs> and I'm like, there is no way this Tur is correct. And turns out it wasn't that, that bad. Well, it was still bad. It, it was, was like bad, in the but... 95th percentile of most cowardly punts. Oh, wow. But the Steelers had made two punts prior in the fourth quarter that mm -hmm. ranked in the 97th and 98th percentile. Yeah. And then so we just might just muff the kick and then, you know, they well, just get the ball. With the, well, they're also playing yeah. against a shitty ass offense. So why would they ever go for it? Right. All they have to do is give them the ball. And those right. That, that definitely is a huge factor is knowing that, the, that they really can't move the ball very Wait well. Wait a minute. Ready? So. Ready here? I have, I have an analogy. This, like punting, 
right, in this spot mm -hmm. would be an exploit because Theory would say to go for it. Right. But they're exploiting that they're so bad they cannot move Correct. the ball. We're just going to punt and sh like prove to Correct. me that you can Well, right. don't move forget, the though, that, that they did move the ball very freely their last possession prior. Yeah. So they marched down the field uh, to get the go-ahead touchdown before muffing a punt. Or, sorry, it was, it was the opposite word. They muffed the punt to let the Patriots take the lead. And then they marched right down the field and answered. Mm -hmm. um, but, yeah, I, I understand why he kicks there. Because, yeah, whatever, man. Make fucking Mr. Biscuit prove it to you. Mr. Uh, Biscuit. So, I don't know if you saw the, the post-game interview or not, but he basically threw Matt Canada under the bus. And I mean, Ben did last year also. Yeah, that's... We, so, that's it's easy to do and well it's easy to do but the talk around pittsburgh is that the entire offense is navigating around this dink and dunk bullshit and it's been for two seasons and everybody blamed ben saying he didn't have the arm strength to push it downfield but it's matt canada the whole time i mean maybe right like <laughs> there's an inside man well something's got to be going on here they have a burner in uh in um Dante johnson johnson yeah and they have uh a jump ball guy in claypool they have one of the better pass catching tight ends in Fairmouth, mm -hmm. uh, and you know Tomlin's so high on Pickens, he says he's just like a once-in-a-generation talent. This guy has like four targets in two games. Mm -hmm. What's going on here? Uh, you saw a little bit of it at the end of the first half, whenever they were in like the the one-minute offense, trying to really move the ball down the field. Um, they were stretching the ball, like Pickens dropped, or or, or sorry, it was Johnson. Uh, like caught a ball out of bounds that, that could have changed the, the, the trajectory of the game or whatever. But the whole point was they were getting open. Yeah, I mean, they're probably, they're just being conservative. I mean, cause, because Trubisky is historically known to, to be a not very accurate quarterback. Right. So I think, they're, I think maybe they're just a little afraid to just let him open it up and, I, and turn the ball over a bunch or something like that. I feel, all right, I, so I understand because you have a good defense, mm -hmm. right? So I was, telling, I was talking to Landon about this on, on the way out. I was like, man, you don't know about 90s football. 90s football was you turn around, you hand the ball to the fucking bus three times, and he averages 3.3 .3 per carry, and you move those goddamn That's chains. That's how you win the game. You're just like, oh, yeah. you're up by seven in the fourth quarter? You win because you just control the ball the whole time. Bro, watching, <laughs> watching Steeler primetime games in the like, late 90s, early 2000s was literally just like watching the time of possession be three to one in their favor, mm -hmm. where it's just bus, bus, bus. Yeah. Screen pass, <laughs> right? Run. Yeah. I mean, it was literally just they would pound the ball thirty-eight times a game, mm -hmm. and it was this old Smash Mouth style. And then Greg Lloyd and Kevin Green would just fucking get after it on D. Rod Woodson would would lock people down. Yep. And you just had to stop the run, basically, right? And this happened for a generation. Well, I mean, you know, it happened for our generation. <laughs> well, it happened for the majority of the time leading up too. Right. But then Smash Mouth football kind of like started to die the same way that the big man in basketball died. The game evolved. It turned into an aerial attack. Same way like you would just now take a guy who can just be money from the corner over somebody who's seven foot and is going to like back people down. It's, it's just not the way offenses operate in the NBA any longer, right? So now that that's changed and we've lost a guy like Roethlisberger who can push the ball down the field, I don't think people understand how much of it falls on the receiver core, receiving core though, right? Like it'd be different if we had an inept receiving core, but we don't. So I understand wanting to be conservative with Trubisky because it's like, oh, well, let's just let him game manage and then let the defense win it for us. But like I was telling Landon, I was like, this is a team that can never win from behind. Mm -hmm. Never. Right. Like you saw us lose a close three point game yesterday. That'll be all fucking season long. Mm -hmm. Every time we're like down two scores, the game's fucking over. Yeah. Unless you get a defensive turnover. Or whatever. It's just such a miserable way to watch. It's like you just wanted a team that can compete on the offensive side with everybody else. I just wonder what Steeler Nation's going to do. They're going to, I mean, they're going to, you know, they're not going to stand for this all season long. Well, here's the and thing. And then they're going to start calling for, they're not, they're not going to call for Mason Rudolph. They're going to call for Kenny Pickett. It happened yesterday. Yeah. They started chaining Kenny in the fourth. Right. So that's what I'm saying. But like, and it's unfair Tomlin to Trubisky. Tomlin's just if, not going to do it. No, so. no, no. And I, I, I agree with that. Uh, and honestly, he's like, gonna, there's going to be a lot of pressure on him. Well, here's the thing. What if, yeah. what if, as a Steeler fan, what if Tomlin was able to come out tomorrow and just say, look, I've looked into the future and I can promise you that if you guys just deal with this, we're going to be... <laughs> deal with this biscuit over if, here. If, if you could just deal with the way that we're running the offense right now, this season will be a nine-win team. 
and it's 50-50 whether or not we'll make the playoffs. Mm-hmm. Do you think the, the fans would take that? No. Over over the alternative being like, or we can run, we, we could try to spread it out a little bit more. We could try to take a lot more shots down the field, be a lot more aggressive, and we'll either be an 11-win team or a 5-win team. They would go for the latter. Right. Even though like you're only the 11-win team 10% of the time. It's yeah. more exciting that way. You know, you right. have something to root for and you have faith but in the, the future. The Wait, problem is when you're a five-win team, in. you lose your ability to root about halfway through the season. Yeah. That's all right. We're an 11-win team or we get a better draft pick. <laughs> right, right, Conrad? <laughs> that is... Conrad's playing the tank now strategy. Yeah. Well, right. I got two teams to root for. My Giants are 2-0. and oh. My Jets were 0-1. Oh it's, it's just... It, very clearly easy. I'm mean, gonna hope the Jets lose. And the hope Giants the Giants win. win. Yeah. Best of both worlds. Yeah. There was one more yep. epic comeback in yesterday's uh, NFL slate. There was. And it's also relevant to us. It is. The Las Vegas Raiders found a way to blow it to the fucking bumbling Cardinals <laughs> in uh, second and ten. Oh, in OC. Oh, oh. Poor Renfro. Picked up by That's the Cardinals. Oh, this is Byron dude. Murphy to the end zone for game. the touchdown and the win. Well, what a hit. I wonder if... Um, yeah, Renfro's in the concussion protocol, needless to say. I wonder if sure. that was... He was down or, like, there was something that could have been called. Mm, he was like not penalty. No, um, either Renfro being down or something along the lines. He was for sure not down. They reviewed him. Uh, yeah, they reviewed yeah, they, it. They, they reviewed it many it. times. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I don't think. Yeah, he's a he's an open runner. I don't think you're getting any penalties there for helmet to helmet. Yeah, that hit right there was a hit that when I used to play Madden, I didn't know that you could hit stick people, and when you could like hit stick the hits. You'll miss more, but the hit will be harder. That was a hit stick. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but, like, yeah. I didn't know you could do that. Like, I know you could hit that hard in the video game. It's so, we're so different. I know. Uh, when he said that, I thought he was going to say, like, well, when I was playing football, like, I got hit like that. No, no, yeah, He's like, no. oh, no, actually, in this video game. No, that's game. not what I meant. But, like, we're, we're just so different, <laughs> I think, in the way that our brains work. Like, even with, uh, actually, pickleball, we might be a lot more of the same. But, uh, so, like, when I learned pickleball, I learned all the most aggressive shots first. Because that's just like the way I'm hardwired. Mm-hmm. Like I just wanted to learn how to smash the ball, right? When I used to play Madden, the only thing that I ever learned in the game was the truck stick and the hit stick. I didn't know you could do those. They were the only two things that I cared about. I didn't learn spinning. I was playing with the Steelers, man. I was giving Bettis the ball 40 times. Like yeah. I, didn't learn, I didn't learn the spin move for shit. I didn't learn the hurdle. I didn't learn how to pass. I didn't learn anything. I was just truck stick up the gut every single time. <laughs> it was either that or just using like... An extremely fast quarterback and just running around everywhere. And then truck sticking people. Yeah, I didn't get to the truck <laughs> stick is. part. Yeah. And then, like, yeah, on defense, I would always take a defensive lineman as to hope to not to throw off the defensive scheme too much. And then whenever the ball was in the air, I would just switch to the corner and then just hit stick. Yeah, that. Like, they, see, like, hit stick, fumble. Did they, like, did, did they just, like, re, re, replay that? Well, showed us recreate clip, yeah. the... Uh... <laughs> what happened yesterday? Yeah. yeah, basically. I might have to get back in video games, man. I haven't played in so long. Only you, not me. I can't do that. Man, it seems like it'd be so much fun to do, but it also seems like such a corrupt waste of time. Yeah. Madden is so much fun. It really is. <laughs> Madden is so much fun. There was a, a time like two years ago where I played our neighbor all the time. <laughs> yeah, we know. <laughs> we know. Oh. We used to develop like leagues and shit when we were in college. No, nah, like I never local got that leagues. Far. I just you know, played. like the whole dorm would just have like a team and we would just like run seasons. Oh, that's so cool. you had like an obligation every day to play your your team. Yeah. Sounds like fun. Yeah, no. we would do it with like all sports. We would do it with two K, uh, Madden, <laughs> Tiger Woods. P- oh, yes, Tiger Woods PGA so good, PGA man. tour. Tiger Woods was PGA so good. Tour. I never was, played golf. Oh, wow. It was so good because like part of it was just like being good at being able to maneuver the controller. So on PS3, uh, you use the left and right buttons to power up and then you use the joystick to, to swing, right? Yeah. So like <laughs> we would like hold it in such a way where your thumb is on the joystick and you're just finger blasting <laughs> the power up buttons. <laughs> Yep. And then you get like, practice getting the fingers wet. Yeah, and then like as it starts to really get to the top, you just boom real yep. quick on the joystick, really rip it. Yep. 
Oh, sure. Somebody okay. please turn that into a It game. sounds like video games might not have been the worst uh, use of time. I'm after telling you, all, man. You know? they, were, they were a good fucking time. I really enjoyed it. Yeah, they are when you can manage how long you play them for. I think the biggest thing is, is that uh, online poker to me seems like a video game. It is. And I'm getting paid for that. You are. So it seems like it would be very uh, negligent of, on my behalf to like pass on a bracelet event and then <laughs> just play, play Madden. Madden. Why well, play Madden when I'm actually getting paid to play this video game? Right, yeah. right, right. Yeah. yeah. Seems Even seems though dumb. your bracelets have been somber. Very He's, somber. Man, I remember a couple days ago, obviously I remember a couple days ago, but a couple days ago, we were going to go play pickleball and you said, no, I'm still in this bracelet. And then you open someone three bets, you four bet jam a hand that never does in theory, but you're going off a hard exploit, get called off by worse, lose, have no chips. You're like, well, guess I'm going to pickleball now. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> to be clear, this man was fish tagged. Yeah. I knew what I was doing. Yes. Uh, I, four, I opened cut off with ace eight off and then four bet ripped it, knowing that he was punting and he just snapped for 40 with king queen off and sent me to the fucking showers. Yeah. What, was this in the 800? Yeah. Yeah, I, I was like, you know, I was playing and I saw, the, like, I, I saw your name pop up into like the top ten, <laughs> and, then, and then it was yeah. gone. And then like, like a minute later, it was gone. You had like, you had like three blinds. I was, what's going on yep. here? That's that's you though. You're a feast or famine type. Yeah, we've of talked about feast or famine on here. You're. Yep. It happened yesterday in the, uh, in the, what was the smaller bracelet that? Uh, three sixty five. Yeah, I flopped quads. Or sorry, I turned quads, uh, that's in cool. a fun pot. It's a lot. Hey, Matt, if possible, can we finish off sports ball with a little bit of love to the Las Vegas Aces? Oh, oh yes. Of course. Yes, yeah, big shout Vegas out to Aces. the WNBA. Big shout out. The Las Vegas Aces win the WNBA title. <laughs> I won't Amazing. lie. I, uh, I did see that that happened. Becky Hammond, rookie coach. I think that's her name. No. Oh. Yeah, that was pretty awesome. That was a travel. <laughs> that was a travel. <laughs> Imagine. <laughs> How long has the Aces been in... How long have the Aces been in Las Vegas? Do we know? That's a good question. I'm not sure. Um, since 1997. No. That's when they... No. It was founded in 1997. I don't yeah, know. not in Vegas, though. Yeah, no. Hold on. <clears throat> Aces is such the classic, like, situ... Like, I get it, like, Las Vegas Aces. Why yeah. can't we be, like, the Las Vegas, like, Jack-10 suited? They moved, here. <laughs> <You know? laughs> like, they moved here in 2017. Okay. That was Becky Hammond's um, first year as a coach there, and she won. So that's pretty cool. She used to be a coach uh, assistant on the Spurs. She was the first female w uh, NBA coach. Pretty cool that she yeah, got. Yeah, that's pretty awesome. cool. That's awesome. Yeah, I think they're going to do a um, Thursday. They're having a parade. No, it's done? tomorrow. It's tomorrow? Yeah. Tuesday? Tuesday. Yeah. <clears throat> so so Where? In front of Caesars, like around there. Oh, okay. A little parade like, on the strip. Go, That's yeah. kind of dope. A little Vegas pride bringing yeah. the championship home. Vegas to turn into a sports town. Mm -hmm. There's right. no loyalty here, though. Because obviously everybody's it's tough a tra because everyone, transient. Yeah, everyone just, every, most, and also everybody grew up a, a different fan, right? So like, even if you were born and raised here, like... You you weren't a Raiders fan necessarily. Right. Right. I don't think that's true as because well, like people love this city. Like people mm -hmm. love this city and they it's support anything. And that it's happens. different with I think the the, the Knights. The Knights Correct. are like nobody was a hockey fan. That's why nobody was a hockey fan. Now everyone's a hockey fan. Yeah, hmm. right. I don't think and they didn't come from yeah. somewhere else either. Yeah, like when it comes to the Las Vegas teams. Do people hate Las Vegas teams? No, 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 exactly. No, no, Not no. as much, right? It's honestly it very yeah. easily could be everybody's second favorite team. We don't mm -hmm. have any sample size to know if they hate them or not. There's only been one team. Or well, they haven't the won. They haven't won enough yet. Yeah, mm -hmm. right. Like once they start winning, then they become. That's why everybody hates the Steelers. They're a fucking Win all you know the time. powerhouse. I mean, not for what. <laughs> what this motherfucker yesterday goes. Say? This motherfucker Dusty yesterday goes. Motherfucker. Anyway, like I was saying. <laughs> I was talking about how, um, oh, the, um, the Vegas has had two sports franchises within five years and have two championships. Mm, yeah. One. Two. Las Vegas Aces. And the soccer And team. the Knights. Oh, the Knights. Knights never won a Knights championship. Knights never oh, won did a they win? No, they, no. Lost in the, they lost in the Stanley Cup. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah. Ooh. The moment of silence. Lost. He, he's really good at knowing who <laughs> champions are. He goes to me yesterday. Who, he goes, I can't hear what he's he goes, saying. How many Super Bowls your team won since 2005? Right, he picked the most obscure. <laughs> two. And I go, two. Year, yeah. <laughs> Same as yours. Because <laughs> well, I mean, yep. he was trying to make a claim about the 
the Giants Super Bowls versus Dolphins and Steelers because yeah. we were having a conversation. Yeah, he was trying to gotcha me. We still got you know the same amount as both of your teams combined. He was trying to got. He was trying to gotcha. What are you talking about? Picking I, wasn't talking about I was talking about Steelers and Dolphins. I was, <laughs> but I was the point of the conversation. I was going to say the Giants have more Super Bowl wins than both of your teams. But you're wrong. No, oh, the Steelers well, have the most. Yeah. Well, I was saying since 2005. Oh, well, well, let's just pick an arbitrary number. Conrad, the, the, the Steelers have lost the Super Bowl almost as many times as the Giants have won. You guys still <laughs> suck. It doesn't matter. You guys how many, are off how the many, grid for years. Honestly, I don't know how many Super Bowls the Giants have. Four? Well, I don't know total, but I know two since. No, well, they have three. They have three. three? Parcells and then uh, these two. Daly won it once. Was that against the um, Bills? Against the Bills, yeah. 1990. Okay. Fucking Dark days. That was my first sports bet. That was the first sports bet I ever <laughs> lost in my entire life. The Eli Patriots won the Super Bowl. And I welched on it. Both against Tom Brady and the Patriots. Yep. Eli won the... Wow. He got lucky twice. Uh, well, he got wow, W's. That's that 1990 Kelsey. Super Bowl was the first sports bet I ever made. I was nine in second grade. Oh, I did not. And I welched on it for $5. Sports bet. Five dollars. Yep. Yep. Have you? Did That's you a lot of money back then. I know. Did you pay him? No, I welched. Where is he? Do you know? Where I he didn't is? have five dollars. Do you know where he is? Uh, I'm trying to think of who I made. The, who I made? I think I made it with Jeremy Shirley. If you, uh, if you're out there, he's got interest on that five dollars. We'll, <laughs> I got we'll, you. We'll make homie. you right. Yeah. You made it with uh, Jeremy Shirley. I lived in Vandergrift at the oh, time. Oh, okay. Yeah. So. Uh, wow, we're all hey, unclean. He's watching. Yeah, yeah. That was. I learned a hard lesson. I never sports bet after that. Really? No. I was so scared. I welched. I thought I was going to get beat up because of it. I didn't have $5. <laughs> I didn't have $1. <laughs> well, you tried to get I plus given, $5. I could have given him food stamps. <laughs> I don't know if you take those. No, probably not. That was the first time I learned about free roll. Sure, then, you could have gave him a baseball card. And then, five bucks. do you remember... Uh, uh, oh, sorry. This is probably a sore subject. <laughs> I was going to say, do you remember we played them in the All-Star game? Well, we were 12, and then I realized you didn't make the else. <laughs> 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 funny, Landon? Oh Is that my funny? god, Matt, why do you do this? I didn't him? mean to do it on purpose because we were on the same team. He made tournament <laughs> champions. I was getting them mixed up. I just <laughs> see the tortoise look back at you, just like with these these hopeful Listen, eyes. You know, it was all politics. Okay, <laughs> all politics. Right, all the kids whose dads were the coaches who made the made the roster, were all made the right. team, no matter what their stats were, of course. And then little old me was left in the dust. <laughs> the tortoise was left behind. Yeah, huh? the tortoise was always left behind. Oh, man, no, that is I did strike out like 782 times that season, so it probably shouldn't have been on the team. Yeah, <laughs> wow, this was. Thank you for that. Oh, Listen, I was way ahead of my time. I either hit a home run or I struck out. Oh, you just didn't Christ. hit the home yeah. run part of that equation. <laughs> Not as much. As you should have. <laughs> yeah. Wow, you really just did that to flex on him when you were twelve. Yeah. Man, that was fun. Uh, <laughs> no, I did. I didn't mean to. Uh, what happened was I was playing first base, and uh, I think it was I, I think it was Jeremy Shirley, but I can't recall. It might have been somebody else, but whoever it was uh, got a single. And like as he was rounding first, he goes, "You know, you still owe me that five dollars." <laughs> that's fucking go, dude. That's no. amazing. That's so fucking great. Yes, that's great. For what it's worth, that was only like three years apart. So yeah, yeah, yeah. That's true. It was, it was, it was still definitely. He's probably recent thinking about it to this day. It's son of a bitch. It's almost driving better. around in his Maserati out in Vegas. He still owes me that five dollars. It's almost <laughs> better if he doesn't take the five dollars because he'll always have the story that you've never gave him five dollars. A hundred percent. You should find him on Venmo and send him send him the five bucks. Well, the problem is I'm not positive that it was Jeremy Shirley. <laughs> Jeremy's just gonna randomly get the five dollars. Like what the hell? Uh, Are you looking amazing. up Jeremy? Uh, <laughs> um, let's see. What? Oh, there's a bunch of games on tonight. Is there? Yeah, Bills play Tennessee. That's going to be fun. I don't know what, what's <laughs> the other one. Oh, Minnesota and the... Uh, the oh, uh, yeah, uh, Philly. Oh, Minnesota and Philly. Right, yeah. I think... Who do you like there? Who do you like in Bills? Minnesota's going to be very good this year. I think so, too. Yeah. I, I, I think... Uh, I'm less confident now after watching the Packers um, destroy the Bears. Well... That game was still within question, I guess, going into the fourth. But anyway, the Packers looked a lot better yesterday versus yeah. a bad team, obviously. But Aaron the Jones. Vikings fucking put it on them. I mean, we can't, we can't actually say anything about that game because the Packers just fucking own the Bears, and that could just be like a... Like right, and I'm, I, and I'm saying from the week prior, the, the Vikings put it on the Packers. 
Like, if Cousins plays at all consistent this year with the weapons that he has around him, I think that they have a really good shot of winning the North. Yeah. No, they, right behind well, the Lions. The well, Lions I mean, are probably the second favorite. They have the Lions. They might not. Lions, no, look good. Lions look good. Lions are great. sneaky good. Lions look they good. They do look sneaky good. And um, <clears throat> Minnesota's stacked. Minnesota's offense is no, yeah, yeah. silly. For Justin sure. Jefferson, um, they have the uh, guy the Eagles actually picked up in 21st in that round, um, that draft. I think Nelson Aguilar. Aguilar. Yeah, Aguilar. they got yeah. him too. No, wait. Mm-hmm. Uh, Dalvin Cook, obviously. Dalvin Cook. Wait, wasn't, oh, wasn't no, Aguilar? No, no, I'm sorry. It was Jalen Rieger. He's on Rieger. New England. He caught yeah. the fucking game winner. It was Jalen Rieger. Sorry. You're Cocksucker. Right. Fuck <laughs> Nelson Aguilar. <laughs> Son of a bitch. He's still on the wow. Eagles? He's still on the Eagles? No, he no, fucking caught the game the winner versus Steelers on the Patriot. yeah, Patriots. Yeah, I, I meant um, Rieger. Jalen Rieger or whatever his yeah. name is. Um, but yeah, they have a fucking good offense. Is Diggs still on Minnesota? No, Diggs and um, the Bills. Ooh. Yeah. Oh, yeah, he, yeah. Good yeah, last where, year, right? Where you been? Oh, He's Longer just, than that. A few years. A couple mm-hmm. years now, yeah. Yeah. He's Thielen Jackson. was their number one, and then they drafted Jeffries, and now Thielen's kind of I just, meh. I was just thinking back to the Minnesota Miracle player. He's like, Diggs! And he's like, run the... Yeah. Diggs, <laughs> Diggs is legit. I yeah, completely I like forgot they even have Thielen. Yeah, I understand why. Uh, he's turned into a possession receiver. Um, he's we, just there to do his job. We, we got on this conversation that derailed a little bit, but there were two bracelets given out yesterday. Uh, yeah. I participated in both. I did not win either. Yeah. Uh, Big shout out to Jesse Lonis, a uh, young man coming up through the ranks. Let's go, Jesse. Really trying to challenge uh, some of the high rollers. Not not the high rollers, but like, you know, he's pushing himself into the 10K pluses. <laughs> he shipped the 1K for 72,000, and I believe that's his first bracelet. Yeah, first correct? of many. First, first, first of many. First of many. Okay. It's a bold claim. Mentality. It's a bold claim. Maybe he meant first of many tournaments, but no, I think he meant bracelets. Not probably bracelets. <laughs> it's, uh, if I win one, I'm going to start claiming that I'm going to pass home with too. Uh, <laughs> if I ever, you know, it's almost like a tradition, win. you know. Honestly, Honestly you're on the board. When you have 33 fucking online events to choose from, and then another 50 on GG if you choose to travel, it's doable. And live when, yeah, like I back. think it's doable to win. Well, I don't know, man. It's hard. To those fields are so. Those, yeah, those fields are so tough. Like, think about how many bracelets <clears throat> he won where the field size was like sub 300. I mean, don't get me wrong. Like, it's definitely do. If there are going to be 33 bracelet events every single year yep. on WSOP.com. Where it's 500 or less people. Yeah. yeah. Then, yes, I think you could win 16 plus. I think it's possible. Because yeah. there's going to be a lot of the high rollers who have a three-digit entry. Yeah, yeah, for sure. For sure. E- even the bigger ones. Like, these prize pools aren't that big, and they're only going to get smaller because it loses the allure. Yeah. I think um, it's possible. It'll take a couple of years, like 10 years. But. Yeah. Yesterday's 320 was only 50K to first. Like, would it get 1,000 people? <clears throat> Maybe fewer? Yeah. Yeah. So it's like it, it's winnable for sure. Well, you can bring up why in a second. Speaking of winnable yeah. and not his first, uh, Jeremy Osmus, fifth bracelet. Congratulations, right. young man. Way to do it. Really making a push for. Uh, really making a push for for one of the the the. I don't know how to describe it. He's so quiet. He's so quietly good. Right, like I don't think anybody thinks it's not that Osmus. quiet that he's good. Is he's he? just quiet and really fucking good. Yeah, but like I don't think people put Osmus into that elite category. Sneaky good, like the Lions. Yeah, mm-hmm. I think he's like uh, I think he's like <clears throat> right on that Darren Elias, Jer- uh, Altman type of uh, of fringe. Mm. But like I think those guys are a lot fucking better than than anybody realizes. No, Shannon's another good example. Uh, That's sure. the canon, dude. Mm-hmm. Yeah, like he's a really good example. Uh, I think like I think where so I think like that's where it ends and then the very next step would be like Lucky Chewy because it's, he plays a lot more high rollers. So you mean it's like the uh, <clears throat> if you're in a tier tier list it like A tier S tier they're just like top A tier. It's not even I, I'm not even thinking of it like talent wise. Yeah, right? I just mean like perception. Yeah, it's just that like uh, like I think of Lucky Chewy as that next tier up because yeah, yeah. he plays so many more high rollers. That, that's what it is. It, it's it's these guys just win. A lot consistently they're very very good yeah. but they don't play in the the biggest high roller to- where all the prestige is right so they don't get that prestigious yeah, yeah. kind of like allure <clears throat> jerry's won them, four like bracelets or, in the last year yeah. well also, also i mean it's weird because they definitely all now like have you ev- not evolved but are playing the biggest stuff now like shannon and sure jeremy, jeremy won the uspo cup well right? they're playing bigger stuff they're not playing all the biggest stuff right, right. okay Right, like they're not going to Triton, Cyprus, and some of them. Some, yeah. Jeremy went to one of them. I can't remember which, but 
even if they're going and playing, they're not winning it yet. Mm -hmm. Right? So, like, they're still segregated from the Coons and the Ikes and... It's just uh, time. It's yeah. Just, it's just a time. Thing. Yeah, even even like the, the Chewies to some degree. Like, Chewie's not traveling to those events either, but when there's a 100K local, he finds his way in a lot. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. And maybe Ausmus does too. It's just we've seen Chewie ship them, mm -hmm. right? But Ausmus is putting together a hell of a resume. Obviously, his uh, jump off was getting fourth in the main. I don't... He throw to the main? Yeah, same year as Greggy, Jesse... Russ, oh, he got fifth. That's right. Russ got fourth. How do you guys? How do they do it, bro? That cr that crew was the entire Bellagio 1020 crew. That's, mm -hmm. that's it was amazing. Sylvia, Merson, Osmus, uh, Russ. I didn't know at the time, but he was friends with Osmus and Sylvia. Yeah. Um, and then so yeah, it was those three were like the OG live regs that played like you know everything battled in cash, and then Russ was kind of like the younger uh, behind the curtain reg or moving into regdom because he actually had a real job uh Reg and then uh the young kid who got third why can't i think of his name right now oh man he's not young anymore this was a decade ago uh i keep wanting to say brian balsba which is obviously the the agent for negranu yeah um but yeah, anyway, uh, I'm disrespecting him by not being able to remember his name, but he got third that year. So like, yeah, the whole final table was this collection of quote unquote regs. It was the first time that we really saw, um, you know, such a concentration, I guess, to known grinders amongst the, the community right. that may not have been mm -hmm. like highly regarded in the online world or whatever. Mm -hmm. Like Jeremy was crushing online, but nobody really knew. Uh, he was beating like full tilt capped no limit games. Uh, um, just like mashing. I think it was, you're speaking of Jacob. Jake Ballsba. Yep, Ballsinger. Balls, Ballsinger. Yeah, something like that. Yes. <laughs> something like that. Yes. Yeah. Okay. okay. Uh, yes, that's exactly <clears throat> what I was talking about. Yeah, it makes sense. And also like when it comes to like public persona, like how much are you in the like Twitter sphere, whatever. You right. Know, being a person of that interest to kind of be like, oh yeah, this is who is in high roller does all these things you know yeah oh. yeah that's true four in a fucking year man 40 years a lot four periods a lot mm -hmm. when i saw that he tweeted that this was his fifth i was like i thought it was his third <laughs> i remember the plo one and i remember uh his first one he Where, won the other ones come a from? turbo for like the COVID relief one. Oh, that's yeah, right. He got actually Jesse Lotus got second in that one. That's funny. He, he said won, he won a bracelet. Yeah, he said he won that bracelet. It was stuck for the summer. He won. Uh, <laughs> or I guess it was the fall. He but. won a limit event mm. uh, this year, actually. He won a limit event and then he won this. Okay. There, there you is. have it. There you have it. Get, Shout out to Jeremy Austin. I see Austin. everything, one of the OGs. Jeremy. Mm -hmm. I see it. One of the big OGs. He beat one of the big OGs heads up. Yeah. Uh, fuck, man. Landon was sweating it the whole way. Our man, Nick Shulman, Nicky Nice, <laughs> man. coming yeah. in second nice. place. I wasn't going to sleep until I saw Nick win, and then he didn't win. He did so not you didn't win. sleep last night, huh? No, I had to, <laughs> I had to go to bed out of anger and sadness. <laughs> <laughs> Fucking Jeremy. Big condolences Fuck. to Nick. I'm sure that uh, second place will be nice to him just as much. I, in that instance where the money's not a lot, I imagine the bracelet just means a ton. Yeah, exactly. Of course. Right? Because now no one really... You can't remember the price points on every bracelet that somebody wins, right? right. But you just have the number of okay, you have exactly. X bracelet. Exactly. Second hurts a lot worse when right. when when first or second place is thirty thousand instead of three hundred thousand. Yes, right. You for don't sure. get you don't get second for six figures. You get second for like thirty seven k no bracelet. Yeah. Where if you win, you get fifty one k. So it's like a little bit different, and you get the bracelet, which is mm -hmm. the important part yeah, yeah, yeah. for the notoriety aspect or the, yep. the public. The public uh, perception aspect. In any event, it's nice to see some names out there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Out there grinding. It's always good to... Uh, I mean, it's good for the World Series, too, because to be quite honest, these prize pools aren't as, as uh, ballooned as they were during COVID. Right. Uh, which is no shock. Of course, that's going to happen. Right. But now, bracelet events on there are basically akin to ring events. And... I don't know. Like, what do we do moving forward? Do we talk about the dilution of bracelets? Uh, honestly, I don't think it matters. Uh, and I'm not saying that as an opinion. I'm saying that like I, I don't. Just, I don't think the community's opinion matters. Right. It's, mm -hmm. it's just. It's just naturally gonna be um, less valuable to win, or less. You know. Um, 
That's the word I'm looking well, for. Well, it kind of goes but like it yeah. kind of goes both ways, right? Yeah, because like the more bracelets that exist, mm -hmm. the the more do they depreciate, technically mm -hmm. speaking. Right. But the bigger the fields, the harder they are to accumulate anyway. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean there was a point in time where it was very prestigious, very few people had a bracelet. Now, you know, more and more people are having the more and more multi bracelet. <clears throat> I think what it does is it reduces the value of having one bracelet. But it increases the value of having, having many, multiple. Yeah, many now bracelets. it's like okay, I'm a multiple bracelet mm, winner. Honestly, yeah, anybody can get lucky once. Does it even matter that much? Yeah, yeah, it does. We have to. Mm -hmm. We we need measuring sticks in yeah. this game. Mm -hmm. Way more so than money, because where people are making, uh, like cash game players who are who are like really pulling in big numbers, right. have literally nothing to show for it. Right. Mm -hmm. So what you're saying is there's going to be certain things that are in higher regard in the community and winning those is going to lead to some sort of resume buildup when it comes to winning a WPT winning like a circuit ring is lower than that of yeah. course right but it's something yeah. and then there's a bracelet which means a lot of course and then there's going to be like <clears throat> these triton events for the higher stake stuff mm -hmm. which is going to matter as well yeah at, at the end of the day nothing matters obviously but you're going to be judged on something right so it's up to you how you want to value what you curate on your resume right right so for some people that'll be uh doing things such as these podcasts like adding value in that regard becoming a personality right for right. others it'll be racking up trophies yeah and being thought of as uh one or being highly regarded in the mtt community right for others it'll be uh you know being able to tell stories from high state cash games that the the community doesn't have access to because there's nothing you can do like i could show you a million graphs but they don't mean anything because they're just me entering data into an app Mm -hmm. Right. That says this is what happens. Exactly. Right. You can put anything you want in there. Right. Yeah, you can remove mm -hmm. some stuff, add some yeah. stuff. And there's no <clears throat> PT4 for live. Right. And that makes poker really cool as an industry, as you can be as big of an industry person as you want, as well as prove your ability based off of the call it relics that you pick up along the way mm -hmm. when it comes to having a bracelet, a couple rings, you know, and having the ability to make a name for yourself in multiple different ways if you want to. Yep. As being a influencer type or being someone that just yeah i think it shows the expansion of the community which is really cool yeah um like there are very few there's no nfl players that are also like podcasters while they're still in the nfl That's so right. travis kelsey and his brother actually just started a podcast I'm sure, I'm I'm sure sure both are still in the nfl <laughs> yeah there, there are there's more a couple. draymond is doing it in in the nba there's right. more it's becoming more popular that's cool mm -hmm. that's great there's, i think uh, there's a rookie nfl one yeah, like, there's a lot of I do think that is like to land its point. I think it's really fucking cool. Like, no time more so than now have we gotten more inside knowledge as to what's going on in the business uh, or the industry side of it. Yeah, and I think that's so amazingly uh, like curious. Um, I, I watch this. Uh, I watch a podcast called uh, The Pivot that is Fred Taylor. Um, who's the guy from Miami? Mm. there's a guy from Miami on it that I can't recall mm -hmm. who it is right now. And then Ryan Clark, obviously like love Ryan Clark. Oh well, yeah. Huge yinzer through and through. Uh, and they're all out of the game. Right. And then the, the, the podcast that they came from was I am athlete, which is Brandon Marshall, uh, Chad Ochocinco and a few others. And like watching them, both of them uh, are just phenomenal podcasts. Uh, because they get people who are currently inside the game and they're getting these candid interviews, similar to like what Joey's podcast was to the poker community when it first started. Uh, so you're just getting a lot of insight into an, uh, an arena and an area that didn't previously exist to the common folk. Yeah, like ESPN <laughs> wasn't getting this, right? Uh, that's what we were relying on in the past. Now mm -hmm. we have the internet and YouTube, so we get these podcasts. But also, they're so fucking good at just chopping it up with people who are freshly removed. Yeah. Uh, I've seen some interviews, like not necessarily on those two podcasts, but just in general of like Michael Irving, bro, like guys like Michael Irving, Daryl Strawberry, Doc Gooden, like these guys that were athletes in the late eighties, early nineties that they were just fucking life. doing Coke off of hookers <laughs> assholes. Like <laughs> these guys aren't shy about it. They're mm -hmm. out there, man. Like, uh, I was, I just ca <laughs> caught a clip yesterday of like michael irving talking about a story where he met a young to and mike tyson out in vegas and to was so shook at what he was seeing amongst yes it was exactly this interview oh uh, this is a jake paul interview or no 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 uh i can't think of his name right now but it's a pretty popular podcast i know them from watching like tiger belly and your mom's house yeah 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 okay uh, he's telling this story about being out with Mike Tyson and T.O. And T.O. was so shook 
as like a second year player seeing what these two were getting into he's like i just want to go home i can only imagine <laughs> what he was feeling yes you yeah. exactly could only imagine yeah i, I want to go home i want to take <laughs> take Man, me out of this corrupt it is, land it is really cool because you also get information like straight from the source of Correct. the people that you enjoy it's mm -hmm. like wow this storytelling i love storytelling also is just like such an underrated valuable commodity it uh, really is in, in all of these content spaces like yeah. Um, you know, we're, we're on five days a week, so it's really difficult to, to highlight that. But anytime that we can bring a guest on, like, you know, we talked about Len Ashby and how good of a guest he would make. It's mm -hmm. because of that, right? He's, it's not just that he has access to stories. It's that he's a phenomenal storyteller. How do mm -hmm. you improve at that? Telling stories? Mm -hmm. Um, I don't know if I'm the right person to ask, to be honest. Uh, I, I, for me personally, it's, it's writing. Like you if you have a knack for writing yeah. and you have the ability to kind of carry a story arc in a way that you can envision the the rise the crux and the fall and the the climax and everything else yeah then you can carry that into like how you converse with other people uh but it, it really is an art because we have friends that are incapable of it mm -hmm. they just don't know how to end a story they just break out into laughter <laughs> That's uh, me. It's, yeah it's definitely you you uh, you were forefront of my mind you could have um, just fucking you know said conrad can't say a story jesus well, christ well it's uh, I'm well it wasn't exactly right it was, here, it was also my friend simmons who's <laughs> just like notorious for this but a lot of times people who are not good storytellers will just front load all of the information mm. in kind of a jumbled way yeah and then realize that they have nothing to like they didn't build up any suspense or anything they kind of just like led with it you know yeah um the story is supposed to be a story, not just a information attack. Yeah, it's a build up a climax. Yeah. Yeah. Also, it's just like if you want to if you want to engage the audience at all, uh, you you got, you got to lead them into it with a little bit of a tease, right? You can't just be like, "Holy shit, let me tell you this story about the other day how uh, you know I found five hundred dollars." So I found five hundred dollars. Right. <laughs> right. It's just like yeah. I don't care about any details thereafter. Right. 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 You you told me you told exactly me too much. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. You have to. You gotta lead Relax. with, uh, let me tell you a story about the other day where I had a big windfall. Yeah. <laughs> like, how much money could that be? It's like, well, when you have, when you owe someone five dollars, you know, right. five hundred. What's a, pretty a big windfall? Win. Yeah. Um, speaking of windfalls or lack thereof, or uh, just downfalls. Yeah, downfall. Downfalls. Downfall is maybe the right way. Down to, bad falls. to discuss it. Uh, let's get into the major talking point and discuss this Venetian cancellation. <clears throat> um, yeah. So I want to go about this in a couple ways. So first, I want to just like talk about the actual details of what's going on currently with them and what has been going on within the industry space for about the last year or so. Uh, and, and, you know, we've seen it beyond the last year, but usually it's like these weird Midwestern casinos like on an Indian reservation that just don't kind of know better where they just rug somebody on a guarantee or like what we saw in fucking Chicago where the guy tried paying out in silver coins and shit like <laughs> you know just weird stuff that like you expect to have happen whenever you're not dealing with a major entity um but over the last year we've seen that kind of shift and it's been a real spit in the face of the community right so uh to catch everybody up who doesn't know the venetian guaranteed uh 2.1 million i believe or maybe it was just 2 million flat in guarantees during the stairway to millions now first of all let's talk about this name okay uh, if you're going to call something the stairway to millions, the last fucking event better either be worth millions or be a million up top. Because I don't see the path here to the millions <laughs> when the final event is Missing a 600... a few steps in the yeah, stairway. The, the final event was a 600K guarantee 50K. So they were guaranteeing 12 players. Mm -hmm. Like this is not... I, I haven't seen a 50K run at Poker Go with fewer than 25, maybe ever. Um, so something is something's already off here right the, the 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 naming seems off uh it's only a two million guarantee for the entire schedule which is like 10 events uh so it's not like you're really getting out there and putting yourself out on a limb right um what ultimately happened was over this weekend friday and saturday the 10k on friday and the 15k on saturday both overlaid by two people so this is a 20k overlay for the 10k and a 30k overlay for the uh, 15k which is probably going to equate to a little bit more than rake back I suppose um, I imagine that the rake on those is somewhere around 1k per person uh, so for the 10k you're probably talking about 18k in rake give or take um, 
and they overlay 20 so roughly rake back in the 15k same thing you're probably looking at like 20k ish in rake and they overlaid 30k so it's like rake back plus uh for the 30k not all that significant but a pretty good indicator that you're not going to hit your guarantees for the 25k and 50k right that's definitely there's there's for sure a bigger uh step up from a 10k to a 25k Mm -hmm. and if the 10k only did 18 people the 15k only did 18 people pretty easy to assume that the 25k is just going to do fewer right uh and maybe this is because they overlap triton maybe this is because uh it's at the venetian instead of the aria i don't fucking know i don't know why high rollers aren't showing up for these events i don't get it poker go is attached it's a part of the poker go tour uh it seems like everybody who's competing for that uh free money that's added uh, as the tour bonus would be highly incentivized to be out there, but it just seems like no one's coming, right? Uh, So I don't know what is keeping these fields so small. Uh, I do know that playing at the Venetian is never really a super great experience when you play high stakes. Uh, They're very nitpicky about stupid things that will very quickly drive away high stake players. Uh, I'm sure it's not a pleasant experience for anybody, but like particularly when you play high stakes and you're accustomed to certain services, uh, playing there is a nightmare. Like getting chip swapped at the Venetian is the absolute worst place on the strip to get a chip swapped. Uh, They just can't seem to get it done, which is wild because I'm saying that within context of getting chip swapped at like Bally's during the World Series where they've literally never done this before, Mm -hmm. right? But they have lists and they they find ways to take care of it. so there, yeah, there are just certain things that are always kind of nightmarish when you're over there. They heavily scrutinize photography. Uh, like if you take a picture of your chips and a floor person sees you, you will be like yelled at. And it's like, if, I, if you can't do that to like, not that there are high rollers out there taking pictures of their chips, but like, it's not a good look to, to like slap Rampage up against the head, figuratively speaking, when he enters a 15K event, yeah. right? Because it's like, if we look at the field, he is somebody that you need to attract. Yeah. If you want these field sizes to grow, you need to be bringing in the rampages of the world. He's your best advertiser. Why the fuck are you silencing him? Why are you making such an ordeal about him taking pictures of his stack or whatever the case may be, right? And I'm, I'm, I'm not trying to say that that specifically happened uh, between the floor and Rampage. I'm just using it as a for instance, right? He's yeah. the type of person. I remember, uh, I think he posted actually on his story. He tried to record something and yeah. they, just, they just shut him off. They so. shut it off. It happened whenever you won the MSPT there. Uh, I was like trying to take pictures of you at the final table, obviously for social. Yeah, yeah. And they're like coming up to me, like getting nose to nose. It's like never, never in a million years would I try to big time anybody in this industry. But at some point, you have to have enough clout where you can look somebody in the face who's like a floor person and just say like, please, I'll have more respect for you when you have more respect for me. It's, it's like, like, I promise I'm doing you a favor here too. Yes. Like b- know when to bend the rules. Right. Right. Mm-hmm. Like this is, this can go out to 15,000 people one way or another. This can go out to 30,000 people one way or another. Yeah. Right. And it's either going to be positively spun or negatively spun. Mm-hmm. And if you don't know well enough to know that like, I'm not going to just not say anything when you do this. You're, you're just wrong. Yeah. Like, you're, you're getting this wrong, right? Yeah. Uh, so it's just like, yeah, I, I think that a lot of exceptions should be made for people who have names in this industry, like DePaulo, like Rampage, any of the vloggers who are coming in there. You're insane. You're an insane person to run your room so strictly that you're criticizing them and potentially kicking them out, right? And it happened uh, with Christian Conrad and was it Corey as well? Man, that story was so silly. I forgot who else was there. It might have been Corey. So it's the three of us at the table we're having a great time. Um, there's a couple of younger kids that seemingly probably have only played poker times in their life. And, you know, there were two friends, um, younger Indian kids, and they were playing a hand against each other. One of the kids didn't look at his hand throughout the whole hand. They got to the river, might be a little tipsy, sure. Gets to the river, I think he, his friend goes all in and he looks at his hand or something like that. And he just starts freaking out, just having like, "Woo! Oh my fucking god! Oh my god! 
<laughs> like he just starts losing it. He's so excited. He just has kings in his hand, you know? And he's just so excited about the situation. Floor comes over and they're like, tap him on the shoulder, whatever, get him up, bring him over to like off the table. And they're like, hey, we're asking you to leave. And we're like, what? <laughs> so they brought like seven security guards, a Jeez. dog. And it was just like, dude. Oh what the fuck is going on here? The kid he's was excited. Some fun, yeah. yeah, he's just having fun. Right. And yeah, they kicked his ass out. Yeah. <laughs> so like they just have this anti-fun stance, anti-community stance as far as I can tell. Uh, they're, they're basically anti-growth in every capacity. And that's fine. They're trying to alienate the pros. They're trying to alienate people who, uh, for better or for worse, will speak highly or lowly of their game. And they're just trying to be a tourist trap, right? They're basically positioning themselves to compete heavily with the MGMs of the world, with the uh, Treasure Islands when they used to have a poker room, the Caesars, all these like low rent one, two rooms that exist across the, the strip. Okay, fine. But then on, on the other hand, they'll run a WPT. They'll run the stairway to heaven, mm -hmm. right? Their MTT staff is desperately trying to compete with the win, desperately trying to compete with the World Series, desperately trying to insert themselves in that conversation with some of the better places to play. And they give you a miserable player experience. Uh, I don't know if this has changed, but for the longest time, you could only get chips. They won't give you a check. They won't give you a wire. Mm -hmm. They won't give you anything except for fucking chips. And then you have to take that to the cage and get it cashed out in cash. And it's like, okay, man, like... If you're going to run big buy-ins here, this is no way to go about it, yeah. right? It's a it's a nightmare process. I think maybe what it was is you could go to the main cage and then you could request other forms of cash out. But it's this hor horrible process, right? Like he wins the MSPT at like 4 a.m., gets handed chips at the cage, then has to go fill out a bunch of paperwork, then has to go to the main cage, then has to request a check, and then they have to get a bunch more information. And then they finally cut you the check, and it's 90 minutes later, and you've been paid out. You go to the Aria, you want a high roller, you get handed a fucking whatever you want. Whatever you want. Yeah. You want it in your account? You want chips? You want cash? You want a wire? Whatever you want. Done. It's just done. It's just always done well because they cater to the fucking staff that they're, they're pulling in. And I'm ranting onto something that I didn't mean this to be about, <laughs> which is it just happens. the miserable experience of the Venetian. But it, it should be well understood that pick a fucking lane. If you want to cater to tourists and be a tourist trap for low stakes, then be that, right? But if you want to bring in high, high profile players, high rollers, you want to run high stake games, treat them as such. And I'm not trying to create this like weird uh, like soapbox or holier than thou uh, VIP type persona because we've made it and we play the biggest stakes and yada, yada, yada. I I'm just trying to say like <laughs> there is benefit to having known people in your building. There's benefit to having people who will speak highly of you. And there's benefit to running these high roller events because the rake is fucking greater. So yes, you have to treat that group collectively differently yeah period right and they just don't they just absolutely don't they spit in their face over and over and over again and this canceling of the guarantee is just another example of that right so the way the stairway to millions works is each event is a satellite into the next and they pull uh i'm not sure what the I, i'm not sure how they figure it out right like because there's still a separate prize pool from the satellites Mm -hmm. Right, so it's not just like ten percent make the next day, because that would just be the whole prize pool. Yeah, I'm not entirely sure. Right. Uh. So, yeah. So basically, like, if it were, well, I guess that's not true, right? So if it's like a one k buy-in, and the next event is a fifteen hundred, then basically the way that it's going to work is, uh, every one and a half buy-ins, uh. Is, is put towards the satellite. Sorry. That, Let me see if I can try to find it. That's, that, but anyways. that's exaggerated. Basically, like 30% of the prize pool is saved for uh, satellites, as best I can tell. And then the other 70 is paid out appropriately, right? Um, so that'll, that, that just tends to be the case as you ladder your way through. What ends up happening is now you're basically playing for two separate prize pools, right? Uh, a reduced one that's the actual payouts, and then the satellite prize pool where uh, you kind of escalate slightly in prizes. I think the winner gets a greater satellite 
than okay, so the non-winners? On the Stairway to Millions payouts sheet that they have, mm -hmm. it says, payouts will be posted once registration closes. Each player that cashes wins a seat into the next buy-in level, and the seat is already deducted from the payout. The top three finishes will skip a buy-in level. Right. For example, top three finishes in the 460 buy-in will earn a seat to the 1640 stairway to millions. Yeah. So, so basically, um, roughly 30% of the prize pool then is being kept aside for satellites, for mm -hmm. satellite prizes, and then the other 70% is paid out uh, accordingly. Right. Yeah. Uh, that's a rough estimate. It obviously isn't that exact otherwise they would be able to include that formula it's going to change based off of the prize pool based off of the next step whatever the case may be but anyway it's a giant satellite series right so uh i think that part gets missed because now what's ultimately happening is those prior events that led up to those final two right mm -hmm. a lot of the value to playing those prior events was the future value in getting to play bigger buy-ins, bigger prize pools, et cetera, et cetera. So when you ultimately cancel the final two events that have, uh, I assume, to be the largest guarantee of, of the entire series, what ends up happening is the, the players who had a positive ROI uh, on, on the seats that they won uh, basically get horse-fucked because now they played for this weird prize structure Right? A lot of the incentive for them to play the smaller buy-ins was the ability to basically satellite into the bigger buy-ins. Right? Yeah. Secondarily, uh, everybody then who was planning on buying into these next two events get horse fucked too because the weaker players that should have graduated their way through that couldn't just cash in for a 25K or 50K seat aren't there any longer. They just got cash now. Yeah. yeah. Right? Uh, so it's, it's a big marketing mishap that is... Honestly, worse than the other uh, cancel cancellations that we've seen this year. So this is the fourth time this has happened. We've seen Orleans do it. MGM cut their uh, guarantee in half day of. Uh, and honestly still reached the original guarantee. So it's kind of whatever. Hustler obviously rugged or, or, or pulled uh, on a 100K guarantee. Um, they made right. Uh, as far as like offering value back then to, to those players. That was that guarantee got pulled on uh, an event that was already in place, mm -hmm. which is insane, of course. And now Venetian, same thing. Yes, yeah yeah, 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 in place. So they pulled it going into day two. Right. And now Venetian, same thing. Like effectively, you have to look at this as though once the first event kicks off, all of the events have quote unquote started, right? And that was the same thing with the Hustler, right? They were doing uh, one of the Quantums. Right, they had that quantum structure where they ran infinite day ones, and then uh, you could direct buy into day two, and they had a guarantee attached to it. Yeah, right? like a quantum stack. You just like buy into ten day two for like ten x starting. Stack. Yeah, yeah. So for now, money, of course, right. So now they decide like, oh, we're not going to reach a guarantee or whatever, and we just decide like, oh, we're just going to play it out with the day ones having been what they were, and we'll make two. Fine, but like, or not fine, but you know, th th this this goes against the integrity of what the word guarantee even means, number one. And number two, being able to use it as a marketing ploy, mm -hmm. right? Because that's the biggest thing that's happening here is now there's absolutely, and we'll get to this in a second, but uh, there, there's no good faith now between operators and customers, right? So the good news is in this instance is that the fields were so small, it's very unlikely anybody traveled for this. It's very unlikely that uh, people are going to be losing additional costs uh, out of pocket or anything along those lines. And quite frankly, this is obviously just going to go away as it always does. When you look at the four places that have done this over the last year or so, they're not places that come with high prestige, mm. right? They're just not. The, nobody goes, nobody travels to play the Orleans, right? Like this is a room that's just struggling to survive. Yeah. And, uh, you know, they made a mistake and whether they're forgiven or not won't matter because they're a locals casino. Right, it's just the the place that old Vegas locals go to play. Yeah, uh, MGM is trying to grow as a room, and they're trying to do right, but they got in over or they they got a little over their skis and panicked for a guarantee that was so meaningless. Right, it was a 50k they slashed to a 25k that they ended up getting over 50k anyway. That's uh, it, like don't uh, make these calls. 
Just don't do it, guys. Just eat it. I don't know what the budgets are, but like, I promise you, you're never going to eat more than the rake. Never. Like, it's almost it's almost guaranteed to be impossible when the guarantee is that fucking small right. to eat more than the rake. It's not like a five million guarantee. And you just lost right. It, you know. Right, and it's like what this does now is, uh, well, okay. Real question, just quick question. Yeah. How does guarantees work? Good question. I have that written down. So, okay. according to the little bit that I was able to find, in Nevada, as long as they have it in the fine print, gaming won't enforce. As in, if they say guarantee, but then also in fine print say, like, guarantee might not actually be real guarantee. Correct. They'll so be the like, word, The word literally has no meaning. Well, it has the same meaning as literally. <laughs> literally, literally has no meaning. <laughs> no, but it, it really doesn't. Like, it, like, there's no meaning behind it. Like you said, it's, it's a marketing thing, right? Yeah. People see guarantee, they think... It's a guarantee. This is going to be in there. This money is going to be in this price pool no matter what. Right. And that's not the case. And the fact that they, I mean, there's, something has to be done because why, why can they be able to just say this is guaranteed when it's not guaranteed? Well, so it's there, completely there, is, there are things in place. Ad, false advertising. There are things in place, I believe. Uh, again, I, I'm not super sharp on gaming law, but I do believe that there are things in place in the sense that uh, let's say they started the 25K. Right, mm -hmm. and they saw that it was going to overlay. Mm -hmm. They can't cancel the guarantee; they're on the hook. Right, but they can do whatever they fucking want within the manipulation of the structure now mm -hmm. to attempt to get the guarantee. Oh, right. They yeah. can add levels. They can mm -hmm. add another day one if they want to. Like yeah. that's the and whole. They've done that. Yeah, that's the whole tournament stru structure is scheduled or uh, subject to change mm -hmm. uh, by accordance of the TD. Right. Right. So there's a million ways. There's yeah. just a million loopholes for them to get around this. And the problem that, and honestly, like, they're not the only ones that are guilty. Party Poker did this as well uh, in 2017 or 2018. Uh, Baja Mar, they did the 10 million guarantee. They, they the very first Party Poker millions. Uh, it was a 10 million guarantee, 10K. And uh, I don't know that they added a flight. I don't think that's true. Um, but I do remember they were scrambling because they were positive that they were going to overlay. And they were flying in party poker pros from all over the world <laughs> to come like fire. Yeah. Uh, and you know, honestly, like I remember when it was happening, I didn't care because uh, in a lot of instances, like they're putting in Twitch streamers they're putting in people that like aren't 10 K players. So it doesn't matter. I mean, it matters a little bit. There's some EV attached to that that wouldn't be there if it was just a dead guarantee. Yeah. But also like as a professional, I recognize that they're putting so much value out there for us that I'm not going to overly scrutinize it. Right. It kind of is what it is. But it was my first inclination of like, oh, well, they don't want to just eat guarantees. That's for fucking sure, right? right? So it, it's, it's just very clear that uh, they will do what's necessary. All operators will do what's necessary to try to uh, avoid the guarantee at all costs or minimize it as best they can, right? Um, now, the issue here becomes what, like sorry let me rephrase the, the the issue here becomes what kind of precedent does this set moving forward in the regards of what happens when a major now starts to fall short right so when the win 15 million guarantee uh for wpt if it would fall short yeah what what do they do now when they're three million shy going into the final flight yeah do you think that they have thought about this and have an no answer? i don't and, and that's not a slight against the win. What I think happens is that they look at past performance. So they've run the 10 million guarantee twice now, and they had no problem getting it both times, right? So they look at past performance, so they see that they have a market for it. Mm -hmm. They look at their performance as a room, and they say, okay, we, we have staff for it. We have space for it. We have uh, protocols in place to run this. And now we're bringing in WPT, right? So they look at the name brand of WPT, and they leverage it. And mm -hmm. they assume that like finding 20% growth to hit this guarantee is doable. And they'll put marketing dollars behind it. 50% and... growth. 50, yeah. well, no, no. You have to look at what they actually Oh, what in. they actually got. Yeah, they, they crushed, got, like, they they crushed got, the guarantee. They got like 12 or whatever yeah. they got. They yeah. crushed the guarantees. Yeah, yeah, okay. Did they? Yeah. The, sec the last one crushed the, it? The second one didn't crush it, yeah, but, it, just but it was also during, uh, a, during a very busy time. Mm -hmm. okay. It was like right. May, I think, or right. something. I was, I was pretty sure the second one had just got by. Right. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it, it, it barely got over the guarantee, but they got the guarantee. Anyway, my whole point is, uh, I'm sure that there's a loose discussion. And uh, again, I'm speculating. I have no fucking idea, but 
knowing how business ideas come to be and how things like this roll out, uh, I'm sure that there was a discussion of like, what if we don't hit it? Yeah. And uh, that risk was assessed. But I often think that when they feel that risk is low, it's just dismissed. Mm -hmm. And then whenever that risk actually comes to fruition, yeah. they panic and it's scramble. Like, it's like a DEF CON level. Yeah. You know? it's like the <laughs> and I'm saying they as operators, not they as win, not yeah, they yeah. as Venetian, just operators in general, right? Like, I don't think that many places have uh have a protocol in place for what happens if we miss the guarantee by x y or z because it, it's a huge difference right like maybe maybe win does have a protocol maybe they've said okay like uh we have a million set aside to uh put into this prize pool if we miss the guarantee by 100 people right but like what happens if you just totally fucking miss it by 700 people mm -hmm. right like what then where does that 7 million come from right uh that's that's the part that i'm not super confident in and i'm i am super confident that they wouldn't just eat it right i don't think that operators would just start eating multiple millions in in guarantees yeah so i don't know what they do to work around in real time uh i don't know like if cancellations are possible but the whole point i'm trying to get at is this may look like no big deal on the surface at the venetian canceling but they're canceling 1.1 million in guarantees it's huge that becomes very big I, I, i'm pretty sure like there's some at least four or five people that traveled here uh, a week before poker masters to play mm -hmm. this event and they're also oh, that's probably yeah. true like too. mateos was here yeah. like i'm yeah, pretty yeah. sure there's a good amount of people that there are some, yeah. Coming for yeah. this weekend to play the 25 and the 50K. Yeah. yeah. Well, not only that, but when it is attached with the Poker Go Tour and there's the free roll attached to that at the end of the year and winning these events are worth points. Also, those events now don't exist anymore because they canceled them. So that's, that's kind of my other line of questioning before we start to talk about solutions. Uh, number one, why does Venetian run the stairway? Now I know the answer to this uh, <laughs> and... It's not a good one, and I'll be interested to see if they ever run it again. But why do we think they ever had free license to run this to begin with? Why well, would Poker Go go to them? Well, did Poker Go go to them, or Venetian go to Poker Go? Uh, unsure. Because isn't this like a WPT thing where Venetian would have to pay Poker don't Go? Don't think so. I don't believe so. You wouldn't have to pay for the licensing. I do not believe so because I think this is mutually beneficial to Poker Go. So what you're saying like is... Like, Poker Go needs to put this on. Understood. And uh, they have to find a venue, so I doubt that they're being paid to put it on. And the reason why you say the Venetian is chosen because of space? No, that's not why. Okay. That's not my understanding as to why it happened. Uh, I think it's to create a competitive space so that Aria doesn't think that they just have Poker Go Tour on lockdown. I but they kind of do. That would be smart. No. <laughs> they could run this at win and would have not missed the guarantee. For right. sure. Yeah. 100%. That's true. Why? If Is Stairway at Heaven was at win, they Sorry. would have had no problem knocking these guarantees out of the park. That's probably true. They're you, just a better room. They treat their clientele better. Do you think... Well, why didn't... Why wasn't it run at win then? I don't know. Yeah. That I don't know. Um, maybe Conrad's right. Maybe Venetian did pay. Mm -hmm. uh, which would be even crazier because... Now they come out of pocket to bring the tour in, and then mm -hmm. they fucking cancel it. I mean, I just don't see any, like, like poker goes. I don't see any reason for them to be going to Venetian unless Venetian said, hey, let's do this. Well, like, uh, you, you're just, like, looking at local places, and Venetian is a very nice venue. It's very well-staffed. It's big. There's a lot of room. Uh, they, they, for, for what it's worth, I actually do think the staff there does a great job at running events. The tournament staff is awesome. Yes. At the actual run, like, I think Tommy is very good at his job when it comes to structures, when it comes to actually running the event. Things that are in his control. Yeah. One of them is how much, he, how much control he has over these corporate decisions, I don't know. Right. But they drop the fucking ball 100% of the time. Yeah. yeah. Like, we saw this with the, do you guys remember the fucking uh, uh, promotion event that they ran maybe two or three years ago? Oh, man. I wish I could remember the details on this, but basically, like, it was like a $400 or a 1K buy-in or something like that. And like 30% was being held uh, towards a, a promotion. And it was going to be paid out in like prizes instead of cash. So they were like triple raking the event. And then offering like these weird uh, like prize alternatives. Like Beats headphones? 
Maybe. <laughs> I, honestly, I, I really don't recall. I'm sure somebody in the chat knows what I'm talking about. Uh, they, they like, yeah. Uh, so Boyd's talking about it. He said they capped the guarantee. That's what it was. That's what it was. They capped the prize pool, no matter how many people came. So it was like, uh, it was like 100K guarantee for like a 1K or something like that. And then every person who registered thereafter just went to promotional money. Wow. So if they got like 250 people, like 150K just got pulled out of the prize pool and Venetian just did with it as they saw fit. What? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah I remember no that. No fucking way. Yeah. How did oh, they ever think man. that was okay? I don't know. And I remember like Tommy having to like try to apologize about it on, on Twitter and shit like that. It was just like the, <laughs> like, this is why I'm saying I don't think there's a protocol in place for if, if, a, if a room misses a guarantee by like multiple millions. Because I think these ideas just get drummed up. Somebody says like, that'll fly. And then it gets greenlit and they move forward, right? And then like you get in the shit and, and you put it out. It, it happens every year with the World Series with structures, with payouts, with uh, all types of shit where it's like one or two people are looking at this. They're not having anybody in the industry get another set of eyes on it. Like they don't have enough uh, common sense or enough common courtesy to have industry leaders come in and look something over. And I'm not saying one person either. Like, sure, maybe they have one person they reach out. Multiple, right? Because everybody has a little bit different slant on it. Uh, they don't double check their work with the people who are actually their consumers. And it ends up just getting absolutely obliterated by people who are in the know, right? Like, no, you can't rake 25% on a 1K buy-in. <laughs> no, you can't just keep half of the prize pool if you get over 100 players in a, in a field. So like, wait, did that actually take place? Yeah. And yeah. how many people did it get? Do we know? Uh, I think they missed the guarantee because so many right. people boycotted it. Yeah, like you say it. promotional money. Like what, like, so they take that 150000 Those are like and... the bad B jackpot. Oh so wait, God. they missed the guarantee. Did they? Or maybe they just like barely got it because people uh, saw that it was overlaying. Right. But like basically the whole community came out and said like, this is fucking nightmare. So there's, there's like tons of people that like had nothing to do with that, that event could, that could benefit from that money. Yeah. Correct. And and a lot oh, of people yeah, yeah, and yeah. a bunch of people that were in the event that might will never have right. a chance to see it. Right. So basically it was that's like going bad. it was like going right. to their daily one two grinders and shit like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, that's that's uh, not good. And yeah, like what ended up happening was uh everybody boycotted it, so the event was supposed to fail, but then they realized last minute, like going into the final flight, that the entire field was only recreationals because they're the only ones who don't understand how bad this is for everybody. Mm -hmm. And then a bunch of pros showed up at the final flight to make sure they like just barely got the guarantee. And they just played it out accordingly, right? So then a bunch of pros on the final day got to play a really soft field day two, yeah. uh, whatever the case may be. It was stupid. It was like a $400 buy-in or some shit like that. But, uh, you know, these are all things where it's just like we have no representation as a community outside of like getting on a mic like this mm -hmm. and just calling fucking people out. Right. And the problem is we don't even know who to call out, right? Like I could call out Tommy because he's the TD there, but that's not fair. He probably has, I would assume having known him for many years and knowing that he's reasonably good at his job, he probably has fucking no control over this stuff. Right. Right. He probably has his head in his hands <clears throat> saying, I can't believe we're doing this again. Right. But somebody has to be held accountable. Mm -hmm. And it's like, he's the most forward-facing uh, guy in that company, yeah. I guess. I think it, the, uh, the problem is, like, the people that are making these decisions, these higher-ups, they're not in the poker community. They're not playing right. the events. They're not, you know, they're not high rollers that are, like, if you had, like, the, the top people or you just had a handful of poker players making these decisions mm -hmm. instead of just, like, higher-ups in the, in the corporate world. Then no it, one wants it, to pay for, cons for consultants. Mm -hmm. What other industry in the world... Would you ever not have hired consultants from the actual space? Right. Right. Like think how how long that would go. Like that would that be that would course. go a long way. Of course, this, it would, it would go kind of so far. It, right. I mean, uh, honestly, like just think of any comparable space, mm -hmm. whether you're talking about tech or uh, you know wh whatever. I, I don't even want to. I don't even know how sports. far. Uh, yeah, think sports. Yeah, sports. Yeah. Anything. Right. Right. Like think of how think of how many people for a living just for a living do consulting. Mm -hmm. right business consultants uh you know industry specific consulting we are like, available for hire I, I'm, I'm, hire I'm not even trying to show us i'm just saying like it's so <laughs> arrogant it, it's just so arrogant to yeah. not have that in this space because the operators feel like i've played poker before i know what's best right mm -hmm. or i have a little bit of data in front of me that i can barely read 
I know what's best. The, the data argument is the one that gets thrown up to me the most. Of like, oh, I know what the recreationals want because like I have this data in front of me. It's like, okay, well, tell me what this data is. Qualify it for me, right? Because most of it's largely bullshit, mm-hmm. right? It's, it's not comparative data. It's very restricted to, we've been doing it this way for a long time and recreationals show up at this frequency. So I'm not going to change. It's like, well, you have no B testing. That's mm-hmm. just A testing, yeah. right? What the fuck are we comparing it to? Yeah. And when I think... Uh, the, the biggest example of this was how unwavering people were forever to eliminate the anti-free portions of, of MTTs. For years, years, I heard the pushback of recreationals want it. Recreationals mm-hmm. want it. Right. They don't want it. They don't want it. No, of course not. They just want what they're told to want yeah. when it comes to structures and things of mm-hmm. this nature, right? Like, they fall into industry standards the same as everybody else. It doesn't take that much education to make them understand like why playing with an anti is better than worse. Right? It's amazing it, how fast the big blind anti took off. Yeah. It, because, it, it because, <laughs> and, and the only people who were hesitant to do it were the ones that said recreationals want an anti every fucking hand. Right. It's like, do they? Right. Do, or do they just do get into a fight about who forgot their anti? Yeah, this exactly. Hand? Yeah. <laughs> what, what kind of logic is that? I, I think, I think the big blind anti, it's, just, it's it honestly was such a, it was such a no brainer that that's why maybe it just, it just happened. There was more, re- yeah, but there was more resistance than you realize. Yeah. There maybe. was a year, year and a half of strong pushback from corporate yeah. or from, from, uh, operators mm-hmm. saying like, no, this is not the way we want to keep it more traditional. It was the same thing with the big blind anti is what allowed us to get rid of anti free levels. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, Right, because you don't need the small chips. Correct. Right. right. It made the it made the operator's job easier. So yeah, now all they're of a like, sudden, oh wait. Now is, all of a sudden yeah. the recreationals love the big blind right. anti. We should oh, do we don't this have faster. To have all these quarter chips all over the place. Right. <laughs> right. It, it yeah. I miss it's, those green it's definitely chips. Though, sometimes. Uh, like a, it's building a stack of Addition green to chips. the strategy, like when it comes to how <laughs> poker strategy has actually changed with the big blind anti versus anting every hand. Yeah. Like obviously not the conversation now, but it it did change things. Yeah, for sure. Um, so going back to this Venetian thing, uh, you know, outside of the question of like, why did they get this tournament, which I guess we don't really have a great answer for what responsibility does poker go hold here? Any has to be some, there has to be some, right? Like name, it, their name is attached to this. So yeah. like what happens, this hasn't happened yet, but what happens if a WPT 3 million guarantee gets canceled? There's no way we as the community don't put that on the WPT. Right. Yeah, no, of course. Right? Like, not, yeah. we're only shitting on Venetian. We're, we're literally shirking all this responsibility to the Venetian because it's the Venetian. And we expect this from them. <laughs> we fucking hate them. We just, expect, yeah. we just expect it from them. We yeah. expect them to fuck up in this sort of manner. Mm-hmm. Right? Um, but PokerGo is, is involved. Their name is on the banner. This is a, w, or, or this is a, a, a PokerGo tour event. Mm-hmm. Right? Like, there has to be some onus on them. To want to not cancel these guarantees, of course, of would course, it like of course make they... it make it right in some way? It does because it looks bad on them. I mean, how would it ever make it right at this point? You can't really do anything. Yeah, the events are canceled. You have to do a free roll for who? Who knows? Yeah, you yeah. Can, there's literally nothing you can do to make it right at this point. Right. So you just hold like the entity of just Poker Go, like the Poker Go Tour, accountable, or like, you know what I mean? It doesn't go anywhere. I mean, well, the thing is, is that exactly. they're they're off scot free right now because the only people we're holding feet to the fire for is Venetian. Why? Because as a community, we hate them. It, right. We think that they are terrible at what they do. And again, like I want to make a case for the Venetian, uh, really quickly, not to play Chin's role of devil advocate here, but uh, they're terrible at what they do because they won't pick a fucking lane. Mm-hmm. They're crushing it when it comes to amateur market. 100%. Crushing it. They're the yeah, best yeah. MTT place in fucking Vegas. It's so sad to say. Not even just that. Uh, low stakes cash, too. They're, without seeing the numbers, I'm very confident. Whoa. At all buy-ins, sub 1,000. Cash and MTTs both, I am very confident. Or 1,000 and below, let's call it. I'm very confident they're outperforming every single casino on the As strip. As per cash, I can tell you why. It's because they're doing a, a, a high hand every half hour. Which is usually like five hundred. That's dollars. not. That's not the only reason why. Well, um, it, that's part of the reason it, why, and it's it's part of the, what I'm also going to say. Their next, pro- they also do another promotion on top of that. If you do X amount of hours, you get to play in like a 50k guarantee uh, mystery bounty or a 100k guarantee mystery bounty, something like that. You so, know what else they do on top of that? Um, advertise. Rake more than every say, every other casino. Take, double rake. Double yeah. those. They take two dollars per hand. Or, yep. They take five and two. Two yeah. for promotions. Yeah. Yep. Which is a lot. It's the same as 
anywhere else that, that more does more rake promotion. is better bro yeah, sure. it keeps the pros out <laughs> well yeah it's, it's true more rake is better in their, their situations because it goes to the high hands and it goes to the promotions well so what i'm trying to say yes so what i'm saying is that they're outperforming because they've made it strictly an amateur friendly environment yeah. and when i say friendly i mean in the sense that the competition is watered down and not in the sense that they're not being taxed more than they would be elsewhere so rather than rather than the players being taxed in game by good players as they would be elsewhere on the strip they're just being taxed by the casino with some amount of rake back whenever they pop off and hit a jackpot yeah just to hold the whole deal Laura, that you can hit a jackpot. correct correct and honestly not to dive back into the more rake is better conversation with the grotto or anything along those lines but honestly those players are probably slightly performing better than they would be if they were playing at Aria or Win or somewhere else on the strip. It's probably true. Very mm -hmm. slightly, but probably nonetheless performing better. Yeah. Their win rate is slightly higher here, or their loss rate is slightly lower. And the rake back, albeit insanely low, based off of the fact that they're rarely going to hit jackpots, is still going to be somewhat plus EV, mm -hmm. right? It's negative EV compared to the actual rake being taken, right? But they're only a dollar more expensive or two dollars more expensive than everywhere else on the strip. Yeah. And they're getting some fraction of that back by playing there while increasing their win rate probably uh, by magnitude of big blinds per hundred. Yeah, definitely a decent amount. Right, not fractions of big blind per hundred, but the, over the aggregate, for sure, their win rates are probably, you know, plus one big blind, maybe more per hundred. Uh, and it obviously it varies, but... Yeah, of course. Uh, so yeah, like Venetian is destroying both for better and for worse the amateur market, but they keep trying to keep themselves relevant amongst the Win and Aria and these other places as they start stepping into mid and high stakes, right? And they just have no business doing so. If they never ran another thirty five hundred, if they never ran another WPT, if they never ran another Stairway to Heaven nothing would change on their bottom line. They'd probably be just doing just as well, if not better, right? But they're unwilling to just lean into the thing that they got good at. And that, in my opinion, is insane. And also why we as a community call them out. Because the people with voices are the ones that are getting fucked whenever we show up there and start playing everything above a 1K. It's like, we just now see what's going on. It's like, you're doing what? You're raking extra money pre-flop you're taking all of this drop money like you're trying to build a prize pool where we're only entitled to 100,000 of it and then you keep everything thereafter like no we're not going to let all this shit fly you're running guarantees that aren't really guarantees like no we're not going to let all this shit fly yeah. of course joe from montana is going to let this shit fly he's never been to vegas before it's true. Shout out Joe Montana. He's never played the ban <laughs> Montana banana. The Montana right. banana invitational. It's true though, because we as the people in the community that have a voice need to alert the general public of things that are negative, right? So when these things happen, yeah. someone has to say something. Yeah. We're going to be those people. Yeah, always. Like, hi, how you doing? Where the people are going to say something about it. How long before Joe from Montana is in the chat? <laughs> <laughs> it's so funny you say that because Boyd writes, incoming, hey, it's me, Joe, from Montana <laughs> County. Yeah. Oh, man. That's great. All right, so let's, uh, let's get to the conclusion of this conversation uh, as far as, like, possible solutions because I think this is the most frustrating part of all this, right? As much ire as we're throwing Venetian. There's not a lot of good solutions. Uh, yeah, the, the solutions here are, are not obvious. So the first one that will obviously be presented is we can boycott, right? Um, we can't boycott, though. Go on. Because all the amateurs play there and they don't give a fuck about a boycott. So Facts. there's no boycott going on. Facts. And yep. we saw this with stars. Mm -hmm. There was an organized boycott whenever the rake went up, whenever the Supernova Elite uh, got canceled. Everybody said, like, pull your money from stars. Like, we'll speak with our wallets, yada, yada, yada. They just got exactly what they wanted. Yep. They curated a more rec-friendly environment, and they built prize pools up based off of the fact that the competition was weaker. And then guess what happened? Everyone came back. All the shit regs started playing again because <laughs> they needed win rate. Yep. And then once the shit regs started playing again, all the good players started playing again because they need win rate. <laughs> right? It's, it's too... It's too much of a uh, individualized or individually incentivized space to ever try to organize in this capacity. Mm. There's no greater good amongst gamblers, 
right? There's no greater good in a zero-sum game. Right. There's only your EV that you chisel, mm -hmm. right? And the problem is, is that the Venetia will always exist because somebody will always be on their last five buy-ins and need to run it up, and that place is just going to be softer than our air win. What is going on at Venetian today? Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> what do they have? Let me, let me check uh, poker. Is it, uh, case, quick. case in point. Is it, yeah. the, is it the MBI? <laughs> case in point. The MBI. Matt Berkey Invitational? No, the Montana, ban <laughs> <laughs> the Montana Banana the Invitational. The Montana Banana? Yeah. <laughs> so what's, what are the next steps? I saw LaPlante was discussing this at length uh, in a Twitter thread. Adam Hendricks uh, kind of called it out. He didn't really offer much in the way of solutions. LaPlante was seemingly trying... Uh, hard to make some sort of change take place. <clears throat> he was suggesting that <laughs> it's kind of like writing your congressman. And I think that <laughs> any of us who have been alive long enough to know how slow the wheels of justice turn, uh, we understand that this just isn't really a viable solution. But he was saying that he was reaching out to his personal contacts at like WPT, at PokerGo, etc. Uh, trying to educate them on why it's so bad to do business with Venetian. Unfortunately, like I don't think that helps. Um, at least not at the individual level. I don't think LaPlante is going to change anybody's mind at PokerGo or at WPT or anything along those lines. He might make them a little more aware, and that's good. Awareness is great. I commend him for doing that. But at the end of the day, the dollars speak. And if the Venetian have some sort of upside for all these places, i.e. they're paying, uh, they're going to keep showing up, right? So what can we do instead as an amplification model, as people with mics and platforms, to ensure that this type of shit doesn't happen because I fear the worst. I shame. fear shame them. Uh, so <laughs> I think it needs to go beyond shame, right? It's yeah. cuz it can't be a Venetian right. failure. No, right. It's not that's not good enough, right? I think it needs to be something greater. Like I think we should be shaming PokerGo, WPT, MSPT and other third parties to stop doing business with them. Right? Because that will actually impact the Venetian wallet. Line. Yeah, right. it will impact their bottom line the way that a boycott would. That's always the answer, right? Hit them where it hurts. Right. Yeah. The, the challenge is that it's also going to be impacting these tours bottom line. Mm -hmm. yeah, right? And I also say, like, we say this, but, like, if the Venetian just fucking runs at 1100 that's not an MSPT, it's going to get a decent turnout. Like, If that were true, though, they wouldn't pay to bring in the MSPT. I think it's just, a, like, a... It's the MSPT can get higher buy-ins. Mm -hmm. I mean, the they don't get higher than the 1600. No, they do. Oh, they do the 5K. 30, the, well, they 32? do the 3,500, oh, yeah. and then oh, the, the, yeah. the WPT is a 5K. Yeah, okay. Right? There's so, a 3,500 MSPT? Yeah. Yeah, they do. Um, in the Jai summer. won it. Yeah. No, mm -hmm. Jai won the 1,600, I think. He won the... Maybe. Yeah, he won the Super Bowl one. Oh, yeah, yeah, you're right. It's yeah. the summer one that's yeah, the, the summer 3, card chat one is the 3,500. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Card pro. You're right. There is one. Yeah, I remember that. Yeah, yeah. It's yeah, there used, chat, card chat 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 there used to be a card player tour also, the CPT. That was associated with Venetian. I think it is. That's, that's what it is. Uh, I'm not sure if it still exists. I'm pretty sure it does. You might be right. Um, Either way, yeah. there is a 3,500. Yeah, I remember that. That was going on over the summer last year. So Tyler in the chat brings up a good point, and this was the next thing I had written down, is can we as a community pressure gaming into enforcing this kind of stuff? Um, How? Right. Write your congressman. Right. So this, <laughs> this is what I have written down. Uh, can we pressure gaming? Question mark. Follow up. How do we actually communicate with gaming through <laughs> right, our community? Right, yeah, seriously. Because they're not watching this podcast. No. They're not taking call-ins. Uh, we, we don't, it's not the same, right? Like, we have access to the top of WSOP as a community. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's not through me, maybe it's not through you, but maybe it's through Daniel or somebody, right? Somebody can get to the top uh, of Ty or, or Jack or whoever, right? And we can have some level of influence there. Same thing at WPT. Somebody can get to Adam Plishka. Somebody can get to the top there. Uh, we know all of these CEOs. We know all the people that are in charge, right? Same thing with MSPT, same thing with PokerGo. We all have paths to the top. Now, whether or not they listen is up to them. But the point is that like, we actually, as a community, have channels to access them. Right, right? there's a face to the... Yeah. yeah, so we can apply a smidge of pressure there. Yeah. Even if they don't listen, we can at least uh, make that attempt. There's no face to gaming. Right. It's There's just no... gaming. It's just the board. Yeah. I don't know and anybody on the gaming we commission. We really don't know how these um, places are going to react. Say, somehow we do get the we do get the gaming commission to enforce these guarantees. Maybe all of a sudden the guarantees, guarantees just go disappear. way down or yeah. disappear I mean, altogether. I don't think. Right. The and and that's that's, that's also bad for poker because that that's going to bring less people to the yep. to the tables. So, 
even if you do, you know. Well, there needs to be corrective action there. one way or the other, right? Right. So I agree with you. Uh, it would be bad if guarantees went away. But of is it worse if guarantees go away or if people are haphazardly not honoring guarantees? You right. know, right. by that asterisk, that little star that they put at the bottom of the piece of paper that you can't even fucking read. Yep. It, it just doesn't matter. Gaming will never care. As long as that asterisk is always there, gaming will never put their sense in. Right. It's just, it does not, it's nothing to them. Right. The only thing we have working in our advantage is if they start the event, then they're on the hook some way for the guarantee. Yes. Mm -hmm. And oh, it sucks that LA doesn't have any um, gaming because right. that's what happened in Hustler. Right. Right. I don't think that what Hustler did would be able to fly here. But again, who knows? Who knows? Right. Like, honestly, in a lot of instances, it might just be a bigger gamble to run the event and pay the overlay <laughs> than it would be to potentially pay gaming fines. You know, uh, we don't even know what the punishment would be for just rugging a guarantee. Yeah. Maybe nothing. Right. Are they going to suspend their license? No. no. You know? Maybe a little bit of a fine. Yeah. I, I honestly don't know. Uh, I, you know, this is something that internally I think we've talked about a lot. And externally we've brushed upon a few times now that it's happened a bunch. And we kind of glossed over it a bit because it was Hustler with a 100k guarantee. It was the Orleans with the 200k guarantee. It was... Uh, MGM cutting a 50k guarantee in half and it's just like uh, whatever man we're talking about like $300 buy in events like who cares but honestly that's where we should probably advocate for it the most yeah right because those are the biggest rake traps so they have the least excuse to to rug on a guarantee right so much of the buy in is already going to rake yeah. uh, and then on top of that it's uh, it's one of those things where it's like well those are the people who are least able to defend themselves right nobody's going to have a lot of courage pulling the rug on a 10 million guarantee 10k like that's going to be a, a career ender for somebody yeah exactly right uh, it's sure. just too big it, it's mm -hmm. it's like stealing from the mega millions uh yeah. or, or some other major lottery right it's, it becomes too big of a story but you can fly under the radar whenever you just pull the rug on a 100k guarantee mm -hmm. uh so i you know i think that maybe we do need to be a little bit more um forthright and just constantly talking about this but mm -hmm. i don't know what talking gets us that's the biggest issue it just very little it feels you know, like it's one of those nowhere. situations that we honestly we have no fucking power and it's unfortunate and there's nothing we can really do because like i said if we don't show up we boycott amateurs play ruins our bottom line yep if we uh, there's nothing in the gaming like i don't think personally i don't think at gaming would do anything not even care um, unless it, the event has already started or something like that. Mm -hmm. And it just feels like there's nothing that we can do at all. All is lost. Thanks for coming, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it's upsetting. No, it is. I will yeah. say. No, you're right. Yeah, I don't think all is lost. I just think that like we are at a point where <laughs> it's becoming more and more clear uh, that there's uh, more of a divergence between um, the actual consumer and the operator. Uh, so as that as that gap gets wider, uh, there becomes more and more of a need for something to something intermediate to fill that void, right? Some sort of um, some sort of representation. You know something? I I say that, but Poker Go, mm -hmm. they can be boycotted. Yes. Poker Go. If this has something to do with Poker Go, Poker Go can definitely at one hundred percent be boycotted because it's a small community of high rollers, basically. And for something like this to happen, that's probably a good idea. Right. I Just don't think if, that's going to happen, though. If it's though. on them. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, they do have some culpability because they put their name on it, yeah. right? But I don't think it's going to ever get to the level of a boycott. That's because right. it, it only affected, like, maybe one or two people that were going to play it. People are just going to play Poker Masters anyways. Correct. This week. Like, it, it affected a handful of people, and Poker Go also just gives a lot of value back. Yeah. They give a lot of rake-free events. They uh, do rake-added events. Um, yeah, so, like, that small community is going to feel very loyal to them. Yeah. yeah. Shout out to, hey, it's me, Joe Montana, or Montana Joe. Did someone page me? It was five bucks. Uh, we appreciate you for always being on top of the trolls and the memes. Yeah. Find those bananas out there when you can. Big shout out. Uh, so to conclude this conversation, um, fuck the Venetian, first and foremost. Uh, and honestly, like, I'm worried. I'm concerned. I, I, I'm legitimately concerned because it's beginning to escalate in scale. Yeah. Uh, and I don't know what we can do preemptively um, other than keep showing up. And I don't know that maybe, I, I don't know that it's a bigger problem or 
than we believe it to be. Like I said, I don't know what's worse if guarantees go away altogether or if uh, the occasional guarantee gets pulled like this. At the end of the day, all that was harmed here was a little bit of value and uh, the credibility of you know, a casino and then potentially its partner in Poker Go. Yeah. Um, there wasn't like an egregious crime that took place here. But with that said, uh, I do concern myself that moving forward, we can start to see some predatory actions take place where like these major guarantees are just getting slapped around all the time commonly and not fulfilled. Um, so I don't really know what we can do moving forward other than continue the conversation and keep looking for a way to bridge that gap between consumers and operators. Uh, but as it stands now, we, our recourse is very minimal. It literally is a write your congressman type of situation mm -hmm. yeah. where it's like, I hope the WPT is listening. I hope MSPT is listening. I hope that consumers of those tours are listening and start holding them to a higher standard and saying like, hey, don't fucking go to these venues, right? Like they're not, trust, uh, they're not trustworthy. We, we can't put our dollars behind operators that are raking extra and then uh, making promises they can't keep, right? With that said, we've been going for far too long. So we're going to wrap it. We're going to be at 1 o'clock all this week. Uh, new time we're going we're gonna to be trying out. I think Christian is actually back in town, so there's a chance you might see Mr. Darkseid himself wow. pop Bef back in. Return? Before we go, we had a sad um, loss this week. That's right. You're right. Thank you for reminding me. Uh, there was a very unfortunate event that took place in Triton. Uh, this happened, I believe... Was it Saturday? I think it was Saturday morning. Yeah, I think it was Saturday as well. Uh, they, they'd paused some of the events. One of the co-founders of Triton, uh, Ivan Lau, he unfortunately passed away at the young age of 39, uh, had a heart attack in the gym. Uh, very tragic turn of events. Anybody who had the pleasure of playing with Ivan knows that he was a class act, always a happy, positive influence. Uh, very unfortunate thing to see occur. I know the whole Triton family is hurting over this and the poker community as a whole is at a loss. So uh, huge condolences to his friends and family and everybody who is mourning that loss. Uh, very sad way to end the show. Um, but uh, one that's necessary anyway. Uh, I only got to play with him a few times. Great joy. Obviously love to play poker. It was a was a fun gambler, very inspirational at the table. And it's crazy to think that he's my age, uh, just a few months apart. So, um, you know, it's a, it's a real eye-opening experience whenever that type of shit happens, and uh, you hate to see it. On that note, we will be back tomorrow, 1 p.m. Uh, we're going to try to get Christian in the building. Thank you guys all so much for joining us. We appreciate you as always. Uh, we'll see you then. Peace. Later, squad.